resistant to it because they got their own routine where they were just grabbing, you know, cereal or a piece of toast with honey on it or whatever. Right, right. And I was like, this just ain't cutting. This ain't working. So I started cooking for them and um, they not only love it, but they, they helped me cook. Nice. Yeah. So it's great. Yeah. They, they helped me uh, scramble the eggs and they help, you know, they, they help with whatever they can help with. So my son loves to cook bacon. He's a big <laughs> bacon fan. That's what's up. I mean, that, that's going to stick with him for the rest of his life. <laughs> so <laughs> my daughter just found this spice cabinet. Mm -hmm. That's her favorite thing is to pull all the spices out oh, of the spice yeah. cabinet and just. My son, when he was about your, your uh, daughter's age, you said your daughter's like 11 months. Yeah. My son used to do what we called the perimeter walk and he did it every morning and he did it at this like a uh, apartment complex duplex thing that we were living in in Davis when we first moved to the area. He couldn't walk, but he could shuffle along. <laughs> he could shuffle his way along the wall. And so he'd shuffle his way along the wall and he'd walk in this kind of like perimeter. He'd work, walk in this kind of circle and he would always pass by our television. And then when he passed by our television, all my like video games, all my DVDs and stuff <laughs> were in the bottom shelf and he would just take them out and just boom, right behind his head, boom, right behind his head, boom, right behind his head, boom, right behind his head. Boom, right and then he would walk to the other side. He'd shuffle his way around the other side and he'd pick them back up and he'd toss them the other way. <laughs> He did it every morning. And hmm. so after a while, like my DVDs, my video games, they were all like smashed and <laughs> the covers were all jacked up and everything. And I was just like, there's no point in even having these covers anymore. So I got rid of those. Then all my games were scratched. And anytime you try oh. to play a game, it gets stuck midway. That was the worst. Every now, single time. <laughs> He's just frozen there. The mm -hmm. worst. Now it's just obsolete. Now everything's on the, on the, even on the gaming cloud. You just pull your fun games out, download them. Dude, are you smart enough to know about that stuff or no? That's uh, totally out of your. It, can you pay, can you set up my iPhone cloud thing? Is that off I can't, your yeah so, off your pay grade? <laughs> <laughs> I could probably set. Up, so I I did work for Apple for a little bit. Um, so I could probably set up your iPhone, but I don't fucking want to. <laughs> <laughs> it's not like, your. I, I don't know what's on your iPhone. It's not your. It's not your forte. <laughs> no. Yeah. Um, not anymore. I just keep it keep it to microorganisms. It's they're much easier. So I, I ran into Charles at a. Uh, at Phil's Coffee, and uh, we've known each other for a little while, or he's known me. I didn't even, I didn't even kind of realize he was training at the gym until he told me he was training at the gym. But I think you were training at on some different hours or something like that at Super Training back in the day. Yeah, well, so uh, from Midtown and then West Sac, um, usually pop in with uh, Tyler Shelgren. Right. So when uh, Big Sac Strongman Tyler Shelgren was uh, in here training. Big um, Sac. Big Sac. You like team, saying that, don't you? Team Big Sac, dog. <laughs> um, and you got to represent. Yeah, uh, I owe those guys a lot. They got me into this shit. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, he's, I, I still hit up with him uh, every once in a while. He's a big boy. He is a big boy. Um, so, so you were doing some strongman training. Yes. Yeah, definitely. Um, we originally started training out of a guy named Fred Larson's house mm. up in Galt. Um, but, I, but before that I was just doing absolutely nothing. <laughs> like I, literally nothing. I mean, playing video games on my couch. Yeah. And, like. What what got you intrigued about Strongman? Um, Tyler Shelgren sent me a text message one day. He just said you're fat. <laughs> no, <laughs> it was his birthday. It was like his twentieth birthday or something. He was like, "Dude, you want to you want to come hang out?" I'm like, sure. He's like, "I'm right across town." And this time, so he uh, we grew up in uh, Marysville, mm -hmm. um, and he was in I was living in Galt, and he was right. training in Galt. And I'm like, "Yeah, why are you in fucking town?" Uh, and he's like, "Yeah, just come over." And I I got there. Train strongman once, and I was like, "Holy shit! Like this is it! Like this, I can do this!" Right. So, uh, pretty much after everything after that's pretty much history that set me up. How'd you make time for that? Were you at the time were you going to school to be a you're a microbiologist? Is that correct? Right now I'm a microbiologist. Um, right. So at the time I started school uh, studying audio engineering. And, uh, <laughs> sound similar. Yeah. Right. Right. Um, so to do this kind of stuff, you know, record music, something mm. like that. There we go. Um, and then about a year into it, uh, watch out over there, Andrew. Yeah. <laughs> I got, I got a degree. Um, <laughs> uh, and I know how to use it now. Um, so, uh, about a year into it, economy took a real dump. Um, and so during the day I was working construction, uh, out of Sacramento, and they were down to a skeleton crew. They had no room for any extra guys. So mm. I was remodeling houses, trying to pick up everything you know I could to live. Right. Um, and then I started actually. So when I started working at Apple, it was things were a little bit more steady. Um, and then I 
needed something to kind of fill my time. What did you do for Apple? Uh, so I was an iPhone engineer. So okay. I used to fix iPhones and pads and pods and cool. all that mm. kind of stuff. Right. So um, it's nice because I can fix my phone for like 10 bucks. And then where'd you go to school at? You go to school at UC Davis? Uh, no. So um, originally I bounced around a bunch of community colleges, uh, the Los Rios Community College District. So ARC, CRC, Sac City. And then uh, went to Butte College and then Chico State. Mm. Um, and then did my undergrad and graduate degree in Chico State and then came to Davis to manage this lab. Were you always a good student? No. Oh, <laughs> goodness gracious, no. Um, so after that first year, I yeah. crushed it. Like, I was super good. But also the classes were amazingly easy. Um, and then I took, like, some accounting courses and just bombed out hard. <laughs> I took a weight, So I took a strength training class there, <laughs> and I was like, Fuck it. I'm not going. I bombed that too, which is hilarious. Um, That's great. <laughs> and then, uh, you know, I, by the time I found Strongman, it was like, oh, man, like everyone I'm training with has their life together. And I'm just here fucking tourist. <laughs> uh, so I started applying like the mindset of training to like, maybe I should just like work hard and get a degree and let's start pull my head out of my ass. Uh, yeah, we show up on time. We work hard. <laughs> Uh, the entire group gets stronger, take that concept into something else. And there right. You go, right. And so I didn't, you know, I didn't play sports when I was a kid. Um, so it was the first time I had ever had anything like that. You know, you train with a group of guys who all have a common goal. They all have, you know, the stuff they're striving for professionally outside of, uh, you know, training. Um, and then you all eat together afterwards, you bullshit, you get to, you know, a great group of guys. It's a team. And, uh, so Learning how to train was like, I can apply this. I could literally apply this to anything. And from that point on, it was like, okay, well, I'm going to do school. The competitive side of it too. You yeah. know, it's like, especially strong man, when you're training in that kind of environment, you're like, oh man, like once you learn the form and technique, then everything's competition. But right. then when you look outside the gym, you're like, oh yeah, everything's competition outside the gym too. Whoops. Right. Right. Almost, did, almost didn't realize that. <laughs> and yeah. before you know it, a lot of times you're getting your ass kicked on a lot of things. What was it like to be around people that would give you a pat on the back? I mean, you know, a lot of people go through a lot of their life if they didn't really play a sport. They don't really get a pat on the back from other people. Maybe you got some from your parents or your uncle or whatever, or grandfather or something like that, congratulating on building something or doing something together, right? But a lot of times you don't really get that, and, and you get a lot of that when you're lifting. Hey, man, nice! that was sick. Yeah. And, and no one really cares about the actual weight. Yeah. They just, just care that they see improvement. Because yeah. last time they know you did 275, and this time they saw you do 295. Right. Um, it was actually, and that's, and that's you know, where the mindset came. I mean, how, how it changed is because I was, when I first started training strongman, I was about a buck 55, 160 Shit. pounds. And, uh, you know, and I was soft. <laughs> I was working construction, but man, I was soft because I ate like fast food like every day. Right. Um, in and out? No, no. So in Sacramento. <laughs> that's well, high quality. That's high quality fast food. Yeah, I should have known that. Yeah. Better. Except for the cheese. I don't get the cheese. It has like a fucking gram of trans fats in it. So I just get it without the cheese. Um, I know, right? It's trans fatty acids. You got to look at them. Hmm. Fuck. Ruins the whole cheese for me. Well, the burger doesn't have any trans fats? No, not the burger. Did you study it? I, I just looked at the nutritional <laughs> cards. Uh, shit's available online. Oh, there we go. So um, I thought you put it under a microscope or something. <laughs> no, no. I don't know how to, I mean, I guess you could, I could figure out how to analyze it. But. Light it on fire and see how many seconds it you takes could, to burn up or whatever. Yeah. You could reverse analyze it. I could reverse analyze it. Like if it, if it ended up in a toilet, you can analyze it. <laughs> right? I don't know. Then your body would have absorbed it by then. Mm. I imagine. Tricky. Got, got. Got to be part of your body, but it's a lot of math <laughs> <laughs> in minus out physics, <laughs> yeah. you know, a closed system. So don't, yeah, don't forget to carry the one. <laughs> <laughs> That's where everybody makes, everybody makes their mistake. <laughs> Get to carry that number and changes everything, right? Right. Well, everyone's carrying the two now. I know. You got to hit the number two, two hard. How, how did you, uh, <laughs> how'd you end up, uh, where you, where you ended up now? Cause now you're, are, you're a professor, is that right? No, no. So um, I'm a lab manager. So lab I manage manager. the Systems Microbiology and Natural Products Group at UC Davis. Mm -hmm. um, we're in the Animal Science Department. Um, so really it was just a combination of my experience for undergraduate degree. So during my undergraduate degree, I was training with a group of guys. I got a new group of guys. When I moved to Chico, um, 
I had met up with a couple of guys who were interested in strongman, but never had trained before. Mm. And those guys are like all fucking stronger than me now. So that's pissed me off a little bit. But um, <laughs> uh, there was a guy there who was running the, uh, so the Chico State Meats Laboratory. Um, that's where they teach kids how to cut meat and, you know, right. knock beef. Um, so uh, he he mentioned what he's like, what would it take to do all, because you got to do pathogen testing on all your meat, make sure there's no um, contaminating microorganisms, stuff like that. And he knew I was a microbiologist. Like, what would it take to do that? I'm like, I don't fucking know. <laughs> we figured out though. Um, so I spent like, I don't know, three months just like hanging out in his lab, um, trying to figure out what it would take. And then eventually it was like, oh, okay, well, let's make this happen. Like, you don't, you can save a little money. You don't have to send it out. We can do right. it in house, you know. And we just started rocking and rolling on it. And but during that time, it was like, if I'm going to learn about the process and do these. Uh, figure out what the best way to do this, I'm going to need to be a part of, you know, what's going on here. So learn how to, uh, cut meat and, uh, butcher. Wow. Um, not as good as he is. He still does it. Um, but now he's a, so do you know how to like age the meat and all that stuff? Did you learn all those different things? Um, yeah, th- we did a little bit of aging, um, but other processing, like making bacon, smoking, mm-hmm. stuff like that for sure. Um, and then there was a, a meat scientist there who, it's just a fucking guy, he's a meat scientist. Um, <laughs> it's like a whole realm of... Uh, well, where's he? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Should have brought him with you. <laughs> <laughs> where, where is this guy? <laughs> uh, I think he moved to Kansas. Oh, shit. Uh, but uh, we'll yeah, out. you know, you, you, would, <laughs> you would do experiments, you know, and you would test, you know, like if I uh, wet age, you know, this, if I vacuum seal it and then mm-hmm. age it, or if I dry age it, um, you know, if I put uh, this... Uh, preservative on it or it's this, this sort of agent acetic acid aging like is just basically dry like a hanging it in a certain temperature and then it grows like mold on it is that correct right um so the general idea is that uh you're gonna get a mold growth or uh, on it preferably mold you don't want bacteria growing there and uh fungi are really good at uh producing enzymes that break shit down um so they uh, go through proteolysis and break down some fats and proteins mm-hmm. and you get that uh more tender uh, oh, so it kind of softens it up, right? But you got to scrape that. <laughs> you got to scrape the fungi. Before yeah, you, before you do anything with it, because it'll um, have a little bit of a twang to it, probably. <laughs> <no>. <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, a little sour. Uh, I mean, it's making acetic acid when it's uh, producing or right. lactic acid, something like that. So this is how Charles and I got chatting at uh, <laughs> at, <laughs> uh, at Phil's Coffee one day. We we started kind of jumping right into a heavy conversation like this, and we ended up kind of knee deep talking about poop. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He ended up talking quite a bit about poop. What other types of tests are you running in this lab? Um, so we're, we're mainly focused on animal, animal nutrition, um, which I guess you can apply to most powerlifters. Um, but <laughs> uh, we're really interested, interested in the host microbe interactions. So what, is, what does the microbe do for the host and uh, what does it reciprocate? So we're really interested in understanding you know, can we modulate the microbiome and make this animal more efficient? Can we make it gain more mass in a shorter amount of time? Can we make it utilize its feed more efficiently to gain, get bigger, have leaner meat, fatter meat? What's going on? You know, how do we, how do we, can we even do it? Um, but we have a couple of different systems in the lab. Um, one is what we call the Rusatec, or the rumen simulation technique. So uh, cattle are ruminants. Um, so we can simulate that system in the lab mm. and really what that consists of is we go out to the they have you ever seen a fistulated cow i know so it's a cow with i don't think so it's got a little hole in it on the side of it and you can undo the plug and you can get inside its rumen so you can suck fluid out of there get inside its stomach yeah well so, yeah so the Basically. rumen the rumen is one compartment of the stomach mm-hmm. um does it, it matter if it's a male or female that you guys study or, or um not generally uh so m- they're mainly females okay so, um, just cause it, well, what's going to happen to male beef? It's going to become beef yeah, right, <laughs> right? Right, right. and it's in a short amount of time, usually between 16, and 18 months. Mm. So to, uh, get a research animal established, gotcha. it's better to do a female, like a dairy cow, right? Because then you have that animal who's going to be there year after year. You make the investment to, um, ha- do the surgery of the animal and plant the, uh, uh, the small window in there. Um, there you go. Yeah. Whoa. Um, yeah. So, uh, that's fucking crazy. So the inside of there, you can just kind of push that in and we can extract room and fluid out. We take it to the lab, Whoa. put it in our anaerobic digesters, then we can test different compounds. 
Um, <laughs> that is insane. Yeah. It looks like there's a, a UFO landed on the right. side of that thing. Right. Yeah, I can't remember which documentary. I think it was the one where, uh, like, they were they did a research thing on like corn and how it's a part of everything and feeding it to the cows and stuff. And they had a farmer like literally just like a like a elbow deep <laughs> glove just kind of like getting in there and pulling stuff out. Right. It looked awful. <laughs> yeah. I well, I mean, I don't, I don't really. I hardly notice it anymore, honestly. It just, mm-hmm. that's the smell of our lab. Mm-hmm. Um, but we've also, um, what we're doing. Smells wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> it smells like the gym. <laughs> you, know, you know, what's really bad is, because we do do these types of studies with um, uh, beef cattle as well. Mm-hmm. Um, they don't have that. Okay. So the only way you're getting in there is through the mouth. Right. And that's a different game, you know. So you got a couple of guys, or in this case, a couple of gal. I've been working with a gal. Um She's beast. Like we're, yeah. you, you got to hold the head. There you go. Yeah. You got to get a little deeper. Usually what you got to do is you got to kind of push your hand. There's a mat of like fiber that sits in the, uh, on the fluid. You got to mm-hmm. go up underneath and then grab some of the uh, fiber from underneath. It's a really mat. wild thing. So explain to me why there's a hole inside of the cow again. <laughs> well, so A for- re- Or on the so, side of the cow, rather. So for A, for research purposes, right? Okay. So we can, we can investigate the microbiome of the rumen fluid, but- um, Cows are really dependent on their microbiome. That's where they get uh, 60 to 70% of their energy is from the microorganisms producing like short chain fatty acids by breaking down um, fiber, right? So if an animal's sick and their microbiome is unstable or has uh, undergone some sort of, maybe they had antibiotics and it kind of off kilted the microbiome, you can take rumen fluid from that cow and put it into a new cow mm. and you can reestablish their microbiome and uh, help them, you know, establish a new community and make them healthy again. So they've discovered a little bit of this in human beings too, right? I would have, they've yep. done some studies where they've, uh, I think they've, uh, done transplants with, uh, uh, like fecal matter, right? Yeah. So this is my, um, I thought you're going to put a piece of poop on the table. No, so this is actually my, um, certified, uh, fecal donor card. Oh, there you go. So oh. if you want to be treated like a king, when you're taking a poop, mm. there's a place in Rancho Cordova called advancing, <coughs> advancing bio. And uh, it's actually run by Blood Source. Um, it's a branch mm-hmm. of Blood Source. Um, and you go in there, and it's amazing. Like, it's a really nice Does coffee that kind bar. Of donate your poo? To donate your poo, yeah. Well, it goes to treat people with uh, C. diff, so Clostridium difficile. Mm-hmm. Um, right now, the treatment for C. diff is pretty terrible. Like, people have to fail three courses of antibiotics before they're even uh, oh my uh, eligible. So to get a really, uh, really sick, huh? Yes. Um, and anyone who's had C. diff knows it's like, that sucks. Like not only because you're on some of the heaviest antibiotics you can find, which is destroying your gut, but uh, the way it makes you feel, that microorganism that's overgrowing in your, uh, in your uh, large intestine or your colon is just wreaking havoc. Um, so if we can put healthy fecal matter where that organism is, right. outgrow it, you know, outcompete it, that's the best way they found to um, approach it. And it's, it's over 90% effective. Whereas antibiotics right now, I think for C. diff are uh, down around 35, 40%. So, um, but you have a really large um, discrepancy with, you know, like the F, how, is, how are you going to regulate that? You know right. what I mean? So when you, when you donate now, they take blood and they take a, a, you know, a diet history. Have you mm-hmm. eaten any like nuts, peanuts? Um, yeah, you right. know, have you had antibiotics <laughs> in the past? Uh, I don't know, 60 days, something like that. Um, anything that could harm another human being. Right. Um, and then they screen it for potential pathogens, things like that. With so. the uh, cows, this is something I always wondered. I, I don't know if you're going <laughs> to know the answer to this <laughs> or not. Um, <clears throat> how, how long does it take uh, the cow to be like butchered and like end up on your plate at home when you like purchase it at a grocery store. So it depends on, it depends on the, um, grade of beef. So everyone's shooting for prime and in order to be prime, I think it's uh, 16 months, 16 to 18 months. Um, anything beyond that can't be considered uh, prime grade. Mm. I believe that's right. So the guy I was with um, at uh, Phil's Coffee, James. James the fat ran, guy. The fat guy. <laughs> <laughs> fat James. Where's fat James? He's not Sorry, James. Um, uh, he's actually working at a law office oh. down in Dixon. Oh, okay. Um, uh, you sue me for calling him fat. <laughs> <laughs> um, so while he was working at the meat lab, or he was running the meat lab, he was going to law school at night. Mm. So always hustling. Every, that's the thing. Every, everyone in strongman's fucking hustling. <laughs> yeah. Um, so uh, yeah, he'd know a little bit more about that than I would. But generally, eighteen months. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, I've always wondered. I'm like, 
you know how 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 fresh does it end up you know really yeah. being but i guess it's i mean it, it always it always tastes good <laughs> yeah well yeah well what we get you know you could eat a dairy cow be right. disgusting right oh i mean it's not great beef it's yeah. real tough i mean it's old you know what i mean what so, happened to this cow there yeah. you go so that so um I think it's from Bigger, Stronger, Faster. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. So that thing has a myostatin gene mutation. Um, so it's kind of like unregulated uh, uh, muscle growth. Mm-hmm. So um, I don't I don't know about the quality of beef, though. Yeah. That's a yeah. Belgian blue bull. Mm-hmm. Um, I just brought it up because Mrs. <laughs> Rosemary Bell asked about it right yeah. now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's a Belgian blue bull. And uh, from uh, it, my brother posted that picture, actually, just a, like a week ago because... He was like, maybe the answer all along was right in front of me, you know, because you know, hmm. he went on the car- a carnivore right. uh, style diet. W- what are some parallels that you've noticed between, are there parallels between humans and cows? I know that cows have multiple stomachs or multiple chambers or something like that. So are there some different, are there some similarities? Uh, it's, that's tough because, you know, cows are herbivores. Um, strict, pretty much right. strict herbivore. Well, if, if a rat gets his way in there, they'll probably eat it. But, um. As far as uh, fiber breakdown, sure, mm-hmm. right? With the the main tenets of fiber breakdown in the microbiome still are still going to apply, right? You're still going to get a microorganism that's going to get a hold of some fiber. For us, it needs to be an indigestible fiber, right? Something that's going to make it to our large intestine or our colon. Um, and then they're going to produce short-chain fatty acids for us, right? Um, in the form of butyrate, acetate, uh, propionate, things like that. Um, and it's going to... F- you help nourish the uh, colonocytes, so the cells, the epithelial cells in your colon um, that are really the only barrier between your colon, you know, the good stuff in there, right. and your bloodstream. So um, they really make it play a critical role in keeping that balance healthy. Um, beyond that, without your the gut microbiome, your audio, your immune system would not would not develop at all. Mm. Um, they've tried this with germ-free mice, and they they keep running into the problem like, oh, but it's got autoimmune diseases and it ends up, you know, right. easily dying. Um, so now they have a standard mix of microorganisms they have to give even germ-free mice uh, to make sure that their immune system develops properly and they right. can actually be used for their life. So um, fiber breakdown is the same. Um, but we, us having a higher quality protein source than um, cows. So cows still get their protein from uh, a forage, mm-hmm. right? Um or uh, there's some additives usually in uh, in their feeds to make up for the protein, um, but that occurs in the what we call uh, the foregut. So in the ruminant, they're foregut fermenters, um, as we are hindgut fermenters. So after our stomach, things are fermented in our mm. um, right large intestine, in our right. colon. That's why you fart. Um, <laughs> that's why I fart, or right. everybody. That's why everyone. <laughs> no, farts. That's why you fart. That's why everyone farts. Um, yeah. But uh, you know, fart, farting is good. Gas production is a great sign of microbial fermentation. So. Yeah, so I, I asked that before. Remember, we asked Joel Green, <laughs> yeah. and uh, Joel, you know, he he has a lot of long, long long-winded, uh, well, <laughs> long-winded uh, <laughs> answers to go along with my uh, fart humor, I guess. But he, uh, it was hard to get a uh, easy answer Solid. out of him. But what what he did say is that you know he was he basically said that pooping is healthy. You know, he's like if you, yeah. if, you, if you poop a couple times a day, he's like that's not necessarily bad. That's that's your schedule, and that's okay. And then so that, that was kind of the follow up because. I've always wondered that. Like I've been on diets before where you don't really fart at all because uh, you're just not really producing any of that gas. But I've also been kind of curious, <laughs> like, okay, these are disgusting smells that are coming out of my body, but is uh, some dosage of this, some level of this uh, uh, reasonable? And you're saying, yeah. Yeah. Well, um, so I love Sour Patch Kids. Can't wait to tell my wife. <laughs> I, love, I love Sour Patch Kids. But amazing. By my wife bought me like... One of those giant, like five pound bags. Not a sugar free. Kids. Not a no. Oh, no. oh, oh no. I was gonna say sugar free really blow you out. No, yeah. no, no. You can't do that. Um, and but these are just as bad. It's inverted sugar, which is a little bit different. But uh, <laughs> I ate like a pound of them, oh, and no. it just it pretty much ruined my life for oh, like forty eight hours. Was um, it either sugar alcohol in it or something? Uh, no. Um, the, so the the sugar free ones would be sugar alcohols. Okay. Um, this one was just it was a. <laughs> 
I, there was too much. Yeah. Uh, there oh, was, okay. your, my, if you give, if you give your colon microbiomes a little too much, they're going to use it. Mm. So anytime you kind of deviate and that's when you're going to see the most gas production. It's like <laughs> you're eating a food you don't usually eat yeah. a whole lot. And you eat a nice amount of it. <laughs> what happens is. <laughs> it's on. <laughs> like gas production as microorganisms are get, get used to a food, they become more and more efficient. Yeah. So they're able to break it down with less gas production. Right. Um, so when you introduce a new food, you have you don't have the microbiome um, that's adapted to break that food down. So it needs to adapt and then break that food down. But in the process, it makes a lot of gas. Like it's right. it's got to adapt to it. So that's the um, you know what's going on with these uh, like the uh, FODMAP stuff. Right. Right. So um, <laughs> I think the most important part of the FODMAP diet is what happens after after you remove all that stuff. Mm. You have to add that stuff back in. Right. That's right. kind of the key point. And you, and the adding it back in takes two weeks. That would be yeah. the same thing with any form of, uh, well, not maybe any form, but most forms of elimination diets. Right. When you remove stuff, you're going to have to probably even have small dosages of it back in. Um, for myself, like I recently introduced, um, some lactose, introduced mm -hmm. some milk, uh, small amounts, you know, real small amounts. And I've been totally fine. Um, and it's helped my stomach digest a lot of things because sometimes when you go off your diet and you eat like pizza or mm -hmm. ice cream or um sometimes even without a lot of the normal uh, offenders it's kind of the combination and the dosage all together that really starts to rip you apart and if you if you get used to some of these um uh, some of these foods then you have less problems right no that's 100 percent right for me, I've always struggled too with vegetables. Sometimes vegetables will just kill my stomach. And it's like, well, I just got to get used to eating more of them. I got to chew them up a little bit better, things like that. Yeah. Um, but you know what? There is, we might say it's a necessary evil. Like if you're going right. to deal with it, but if you make them a part of your daily diet, you know, it's not that bad. That's where like right. everyone's like, oh, I can't eat cabbage. Well, if you eat fucking cabbage every day, you know, you wouldn't have this problem. Right. But you eat it like once around St. Patrick's Day and <laughs> you blame cabbage, right? Yeah. So, um, Damn, you know. St. Patrick's Day. <laughs> <laughs> and your corned beef. Fucking yeah. pastrami bastard. So, what? A, what is... So, oh, go ahead. No, I was just going to ask, because you had said... So, something about the cow's stomach is the reverse of our stomach, and that's how we produce gas. Um, well, um, the, the cow's stomach... So, the cow has multiple chambers in, in its mm -hmm. stomach. Um, and it's what we call a foregut fermenter, mm -hmm. right? So, it's a ruminant. B before, yeah. Right, okay. so all... Uh, in, so... In the rumen, of one section of the cow's stomach, that's pretty much where it's a, it's like a giant anaerobic digester. So you have a huge vat of incredibly concentrated microorganisms that are breaking down fiber, right? The fiber gets broken down before it reaches the small intestine, the large intestine, right? Where they're ultimately going to get, going to get absorbed. For us, fiber gets broken down in the large intestine and the colon for the most part by microorganisms and it's pretty much absorbed directly um through the large intestine and the colon but with that cow still definitely fart right yes yeah. so that brings up an important point everyone asks like <laughs> <laughs> everyone asks like well uh because we're doing a lot of stuff with methane mitigation everyone mm -hmm. always says like oh so you're trying to make methane like less meth methanogenic farts like that's not <laughs> true so actually, if you, if you look at it, like the rumen where all the methane is actually produced is very far from the back end, mm -hmm. right? That has to travel a long way. Mm -hmm. So actually, in most of the methane- Build it up a lot of power. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, so all the methane actually comes out from the mouth, most of it, oh. more than 80% more than of it. And what that is, is because ruminants, they, what they do is called they rechew the cud, right? What we're doing right now, we're cutting the cud, right? So they eat and then they re they spit it back up and they chew it some more, mm. right? And they swallow it back down again. So they're breaking it down into smaller and smaller bits. So microorganisms can get in deeper. Enzymes can get in deeper. They can more completely break down that fiber. So um, in the process of belching that back up, mm -hmm. um, they call it eructation. It, the methane leaves through the uh, through the mouth and yeah. the nostrils. Because like aren't. I mean, it was very crudely put, but like cow farts are like tearing up like the ozone layer because of methane. So, and and that's and that's and that's the opposite. It's it's the cow burps. Okay. Right. Well, that clarifies a lot. Because <laughs> I was curious. I'm like, well, one, it sounds pretty damn funny. It's like farts are literally right. destroying the universe, right? And that's or the planet. <laughs> and that's been the headline for a long time. Yeah. Um. But no, it's it's that's definitely not the case right now. It's, is there much truth to that? Is it is it is it is it a problem what the cows are producing, whether it's from their ass or their mouth? <laughs> 
Uh, yeah. So um, uh, methane is about 30 times more potent of a greenhouse gas than CO2. Um, and uh, so the way greenhouse gases work, they go into the atmosphere, they trap um, uh, heat, radiant heat, which is uh, effectively uh, increasing the global climate uh, on Earth. But um, really what, we're, what our lab's trying to do is we're trying to find ways, how can we mitigate that? But how can we, I mean, solving one problem isn't, a solution, right? Right. So it, you have one problem, then there's another issue. There's call another up issue. a guy named Elon Musk, right? Right. right. So uh, <laughs> you solve all the problems. Yeah, he's got to know what's going on. He's like him and Jeff Bezos. They make robots and stuff, right? And rockets. Yeah. <laughs> so um, most recently, so you might have seen in the UC Davis news things like that. People were coming out. Um, so what we've been able to do is add uh, a little bit of seaweed to mm. cattle feed, uh, or so dairy cattle feed in this case. Interesting. And we're able to pretty much reduce the methane production by about 65% hmm. um, in actual animal trials. Wow. So we first did this in That's our crazy. artificial gut system in the lab um, using a little bit higher dose. And we were able to pretty much eliminate methane. Um, so the problem there is, is we do things in trial format in the lab first because then we can measure like volatile fatty acids. Like I could, I can eliminate methane production from any animal, right? I can pour bleach down it and it would die. <laughs> um, and then it wouldn't make any methane. <laughs> no more methane. <laughs> but so the volatile fatty acids are such an important part of the animal's diet that if you inhibit methane production, but you're also mm. inhibiting short, short chain fatty acid production, you're not doing any good. Right. The animal's not going to grow as well. It's not going to be as healthy. It might have you know, other health problems. So you need to find a way that you can uh, keep that so short-chain fatty acid production up, but also kind of directly inhibit methane. Do you think sustainability of uh, especially things like cattle is, is an issue? Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of talk about like fake meat being made and stuff like that. Do you, do you kind of foresee 20 years from now, 50 years from now that we don't have we don't have regular meat anymore. No, we're gonna have meat. <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> well, I mean, uh, isn't it kind of like already started with like McDonald's and fast food? Yeah, I mean, um, a lot of a lot of fillers. Yeah, right. A lot of that stuff is fillers. Um, I try to stray away from ground beef uh, mm. for the most part, unless um, you know you can find it ground yourself or grinding yourself yeah. right, from a whole they muscle. Ground cut. up small children in there. I heard. <laughs> <laughs> just here in California. <laughs> just somehow. It's outside of Davis, though. Like, yes, they don't let you do Davis. it there. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I think we're going to start exploring uh, different protein sources for sure, but it's all going to be about efficiency. Can we increase efficiency? So that's the other part of methane production is methane is actually a waste process in the animal. It actually takes a lot of energy away from the animal that could be used to build mass or to produce milk, things like that. Mm. And it's about... Seven to twelve percent of the total energy consumption. So, if we can inhibit methanogenesis, then potentially that energy could be redirected into short chain fatty acid production for use in the animal's energy and mm. larger mass, right? More right. milk, things like that. Don't they sometimes, uh, some of the farms, don't they somehow use the methane to? You can, right? To, yeah, uh, as a as a energy source, right? Right. So, um, you burn it. Right, so you can burn that methane down into CO two and release energy. It is it's a it's a natural. You start your car with that <laughs> cow uh, farts. I'm just, yeah. Cow burps. I'm just thinking of Dumb and Dumber when he farts into the lighter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. It's well, similar. Um, so most humans actually don't have methanogens. Um, mostly, what you're seeing is just force. <laughs> but <laughs> I just got to image everybody run out to their car in the morning, farting into the, yeah. <laughs> the gas tank. <laughs> Everyone's eating cabbage, like, oh, fuck, got to yeah. fill up. Yeah. Oh, man, I can't get the car to start. More broccoli. <laughs> Raw broccoli. Raw broccoli. Um, but, yeah, it's, <laughs> I think, a multifaceted approach, you know, um, making more efficient animals, mm. you know, decreasing the methane, making bigger animals on less feed. I think that's most great, um, you know, solutions are going to have, are going to be multifaceted. Now, now so. are cows somewhat, uh, this is going to sound weird, but cows are somewhat like man-made nowadays anyway right because they came from other they came from other animals at some point and then were bred to kind of be the way they are today so the that, the domestic I, don't know, I could be way off i just <laughs> i mean there's always been a cow yeah, right? yeah. but some there's point. been a significant just like dogs there's yeah. been a significant breeding effort to get animals to be more efficient right right we would the uh, a wild cow looks a lot different if you could find a wild cow um than what you see in uh, right. uh, pastures today, uh, you know, people who are raising uh, beef for production. Yeah. 
So uh, genetics has a large part to do it, just like you saw with the. Uh, uh, I've uh, seen, uh, I, and I don't, you know, it's the internet, so I don't know. I've seen uh, images before of you, what people would say were like, you know, cows from thousands and thousands of years ago. Mm-hmm. Where they had these big ass antlers, and they were kind of jacked, and they were a lot thinner looking. You know, they weren't they weren't what you typically see today. You know, mm. but I don't know. <laughs> um, you know, and that's <clears throat> I could get. I couldn't personally get much deeper into the uh, uh, the animal science portion of it because I'm a microbiologist. Right. Um, I know what animals do when they're dead, um, but, <laughs> uh, and I can analyze the room of microbiome. But right. Um, you know that's why we're in the animal science department. We have people for that. Tell me about some of this uh, studying of uh, iron that you did, and uh, was that in humans or was that in cows or? Um, so mostly just lifting weights. No, I'm fine. Uh, so, uh, no. Uh, yeah, and Andrew tried to take a big bite of iron a couple, a couple uh, about a week ago. He was yeah. bench pressing and the weight mm-hmm. went mm-hmm. wing nice. right over his teeth. Um, so the, the iron studies, um, I was, uh, doing my thesis in Chico and, uh, we were trying to understand, uh, so there's a, what we know about microorganisms and microbiology is ridiculously small. Um. So we're able to culture, so grow on like a petri dish or in, in broth media, about 1% of the organisms we know that are out there. And I mean, some of these are extreme organisms. We're talking about organisms that grow at, you know, pH 2. They, they can grow in your battery acid um, mm-hmm. or, you know, in boiling hot springs and sulfur mm-hmm. springs. Um, but they have a whole host of physiologies. So we studied organisms that um, were able to breathe iron and... Uh, but in the process of breathing iron, they may help liberate uh, another heavy metal, which is mercury. Mm. So I did my uh, thesis in uh, Tamales Bay, um, in downstream from what's called the Gambonini Mercury Mine. It's an old uh, abandoned mine. They used to mine cinnabar ore, which is where you get mercury. And so they mined mercury on the coast of California, and then they brought it down to the Sierra Nevadas to extract the gold from the mountains. Mm. Right. But then they just like abandoned it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, then all the mercury just kind of washed down shore <clears throat> in the estuary. Um, so it contaminated a lot of the wetland there. And uh, what my, my thesis was about if, you know, the iron, oxidation and reduction of iron, so the breathing of iron by different organisms, um, does it liberate mercury? And does it uh, aid it in becoming a more potent neurotoxin like we see today? So mo- uh, not all mercury is terrible for you. Right. Um, like my grandpa used to have like a big cup of mercury and he'd stick his finger in it, right? Um, nothing happened, right? You right, die. Right. Um, but it's when it gets transformed by microorganisms. Mm. So there's like sulfate reducing bacteria. So organisms that breathe sulfur, um, they can add a methyl group. So once it has a methyl group on it, it's an organic, I mean, it's an organic molecule. Mm. Now it can pass the blood brain barrier, the placental barrier. And that's when it really starts to do damage and its absorption rate, it skyrockets. So it goes from an absorption rate as elemental mercury of about 2% to an absorption rate of about 99%. Wow. So if you were to, you know, take a little bit of methylmercury, it'd go straight to your straight to your brain, your bloodstream, wherever else it needs to go. So um, that was my work with there, and that was my first uh, taste of uh, metagenomics. Mm. So that's where I learned about um, how to how to use metagenomics and uh, the bioinformatics behind it, and that kind of was a precursor to the uh, the lab I joined today because we use a lot of metagenomics to study the mi- rumen microbiome, things like that. Right. So. What are some things that you've learned? Uh, that you're able to maybe apply to yourself a little bit or to apply to general nutrition. Has there been anything? Because obviously like what the cow eats has got to be so different, but in uh, learning all this stuff about the gut microbiome and, and different things, I'm sure you've come across some things that have been helpful to yourself and maybe to some other athletes. Right. Um, so a lot of what I learned is that a lot of what you see out there is garbage um, <laughs> as far as research is concerned because you know, we're just, we're scratching the surface of, um, microbiome. Right. And so you see a lot of studies that are like, here's what the organisms are. But, um, everyone gets so excited right, right. away. They're like, oh my God, is he, we could, this could be our, this could be our way of doing this or right. whatever. Right. And, um, what we're, st- what we're seeing now is that, uh, even a lot of those beginning studies that, you know, like a ratio of this bacteria to this bacteria means you're fat or like, mm-hmm. you know, fat people tend to have more of this bacteria. Right. Um, and there, there is some validity to that. They've done that in germ-free mice. They transplanted a, a lean mouse's microbiome into a fat mouse, and that right. fat mouse loses weight, and vice versa. Yeah, those things are hard to, uh, they're hard to tell sometimes. Like uh, somebody's like uh, palate and food choices was probably uh, 
<clears throat> was probably generated, created for a long time, and then their stomach is now sending the message of like, hey, we need more of this junk. We need more of these, like, um, uh, I was trying to think of an example. So if you were to eat a chicken breast and some broccoli, but you're used to eating 7-Eleven, your, your stomach is literally telling you like, hey, this doesn't have what we normally are used to having. Um, and, and it will, for a lot of people, that's what makes a diet so hard and, and those cravings are so strong. We don't have like a physiological need necessarily for uh, the things that you might get at 7-Eleven or Doritos, but once we get the taste for it, and now it's encoded into our brain. Uh, now we have our brain and our stomach kind of having different conversations going on. Stomach saying, hey, man, like we need some nutrients here. But your brain's probably saying, hey, it'd be great if we went back to those. <laughs> what were those red, like whatever that red bag was. Just grab that red bag and then that orange drink. Grab that from that 7-Eleven and like get out of there. It'll be perfect. <laughs> pour, pour the chips in the drink and just drink it. Like, <laughs> crush it. Yeah. Because, yeah. um, I mean, ha- we've had... Some people on here kind of saying that the stomach can almost override the brain in some way, almost in a way of like, in a sense, making you a little bit crazy. Like, oh, yeah. Like, I'm going for this, even though you don't really want to make that choice. Right. Oh, and we know, I mean, uh, the addiction mechanisms of, you know, uh, of sugar right. are very strong. Um, and there is a little bit of a role. Um, just recently, there's there, a role has been shown in the microbiome in modulating that, um, dampening some of those uh, reward processes. Um, so uh, we can get into that if, if you want, but, um, <laughs> that's going to be a tangent. Yeah. But, uh, so. No, I like that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, it was one of the articles I, I, I shot to you. I don't know if I have time to read it, but I barely have time to read it. Uh, <laughs> I'll have to check it out. That's like the hardest part of my job is trying to keep current on literature. Yeah. Um, cause there's so much every day. You I mean, program that iPhone and read it to you. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. If only, yeah, if only. Um, it kind of can, but kind of can't. Kind of can. So what I need I is... I put it in my notes and I have it read me stuff, but it doesn't always do it. So what I need is just like <laughs> someone dedicated, like like this setup right here, where you just like, people who publish, they just dictate what they did and just mm. like speak it to me. And then I could re- like listen to it on my way to work. Mm. Like, awesome. Digested a paper on my way to work. Perfect. <laughs> um, but you don't see that. You get like short snippets of what people do. Right. Cliff um, notes. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and that doesn't tell me what I want to know. Like for me, like I want to know, like I want to get in the methods um, right. and know everything about it and make fun of you or, uh, you know, tear it apart. <laughs> so, um, but we do have a model now um, that we've been using as an analog for the human gut. Um, and that, that's using the intestinal content from pigs. Mm. And so we're able to screen a lot of compounds um, in that model to see their viability, you know, things like, you know, what, what, uh, so in humans, the main volatile fatty acids are going to be, uh, butyrate and let's see, I think it's acetate or propionate, all three, but mostly butyrate. Butyrate's the most important one. Um, and so we can test different compounds and we can see, okay, how does the microbiome change? Um, but how does the short chain fatty acid profile change? You know, if I add, if this one, um, and so recently we were able to uh, corroborate some results that we'd seen before in our model. Um, and that's why I shot you like, make sure you throw that inulin in there when you're getting your fiber. Yeah, in. Yeah. Um, so, uh, inulin was, seems to work pretty well, increase in butyrate production. Mm. And, um, and this is one of the reasons why. That naturally in some foods as well, maybe? Butyrate's in butter. Oh, okay. And that's why it's called butter. Um, well, there you go. Yeah. Uh, but when you think about it. Oh, that's the whole bulletproof coffee. Right. Quote unquote. But when you think theory. about it, um, <laughs> When you're ingesting butter, right. it's getting absorbed in your small intestine, um, so and then it's going to your bloodstream and going everywhere else. I understand. So everything's you, just going to like a lot of the way the things work outside your body once they once you ingest them, then they get kind of torn apart and right. Well, it's just going to a spots. different pathway. So where you right. really need that butyrate and why fiber fermentation is so important in your you colon? You need it intact. Well, you need it produced in your colon. So um, there's a uh, idea called the Warburg hypothesis. So mm-hmm. it's called the Warburg uh, theory of cancer um, or cancer um, metabolomics or something like that. Um, really what it says is like uh, cancer cells have jacked up mitochondria. Mm-hmm. Side fact, mitochondria used to be free living bacteria. But right. Another offshoot. Um, so they're, what does the mitochondria do? Right, It's beta oxidation of fatty acids. That's what it does. Right, right. That's That's its main job 
Um, but if it can't do that, if a cell, if a cell's mitochondria isn't functioning optimally, it's going to increase fermentation, right? It's going to start utilizing sugar and operating predominantly on sugar, and it's a much, much less efficient pathway, right? You're only getting like two ATP as opposed to when you run it through uh, the mitochondria, you're getting like 32 ATP. Mm. So um, what happens is if you can starve those cancerous cells, if you can eliminate sugars and, uh, you know, simple, simple carbohydrates, and you can predominantly fuel those colonocytes with butyrate, so a short chain fatty acid that can only be metabolized by the mitochondria, then you're giving your healthy cells a competitive advantage, right? Because they have to, you know, the, the cancer cells have to work twice as hard to get, you know, right. the energy. Whereas in these, this butyrate's only produced via the fermentation of carbohydrates, right? Of these, of these complex carbohydrates, these mm-hmm. ingestible fibers. So, and you're not going to get that anywhere else. Right. So what happens is your cells, um, so that you have like a one cell layer deep. Um, and in between two cells is what we call a tight junction. And that tight junction regulates things like um, sodium, potassium, salts, water flow um, from the colon be reabsorbed back into the bloodstream. But if you're not fueling your micro, your, your colonocytes properly, right? They're not getting their short chain fatty acids and they're not, they're not healthy enough. Their uh, tight junction starts to degrade. And then those tight junctions aren't holding everything back. So there is a direct link between gut permeability and what we call LPS. So a, a compound called lipopolysaccharide, which is actually a piece of bacteria. Mm. When bacteria get in the blood, it's like bad, bad news, bad news bears. So, um, signals, all kinds of inflammation cascades, right? Um, is that kind of like leaky gut? It's the, the premise of leaky gut, but it's evolved. Um, we, we understand it a lot better now. Gotcha. Um, I think, uh, like in the early 2000s, like leaky gut was hot. Like, <laughs> it's like a thing, yeah. yeah. I got it. I, yeah. got it. I have leaky gut. Um, yeah. <laughs> it's kind of, I'm eating all lean potato chips. It's oh, God, yeah. That's disgusting. <laughs> um, so, uh, but it goes beyond that now. And we understand like protein. So protein shouldn't make it to your colon, mm. right? So it's one of, the, one of the largest concerns I have with like the carnivore diet is I think you should eat as much protein as you can as long as it's digested and absorbed before it gets to your colon. Mm. Because when amino acids and proteins are fermented by microorganisms, they produce a lot of weird crap, um, phenols and amines and things that are, we know are cytotoxic, so they're toxic to cells. Um, and that has been associated before with uh, like colorectal cancer and distal colorectal right. cancer. So, yeah, eat as much meat as you want. So you might be somewhat like, backed up in a sense, I guess you'd say, right? Well, it, it's it's not going to back you up. It's just going to, I mean, you're going to be producing toxic metabolism. You're feeding your microbiome um, compounds that it's going to break down into toxic metabolites. Yeah. Um, and everyone's going to be like, well, they're not toxic. Like, there, there is really strong evidence to show that mm-hmm. these, uh, a lot of these compounds are not right. great. Um, so if you can I wish there was a way to screen for that, right? Like, am I eating too much protein? Like, analyze my, analyze <laughs> right. my poop. Um, so eat as much protein as you want as long as it's absorbed. And then fiber's not for you. <laughs> fiber's for your microbes, mm. right? And then just recognizing that there's that relationship there. I mean, I think a lot of people would do really well. Uh, when you keep saying butyrate, uh, is that similar to... Uh, like I, I realize the ketones that people are selling, it, it wouldn't be the same thing, but is it, is it similar in some way? Is it, is, are you talking about a ketone? Is butyrate a ketone? It is not. Um, so it's a short chain fatty acid. A ketone is, uh, has a very specific structure. So even what we call, you know, um, um, what's the hot one? Beta hydroxybutyrate. Beta, yeah. That's not even a ketone. Okay. Right. So that's technically a carboxylic acid. Um, it was, it's, so that's why they call it a ketone body is because it came from a ketone. Your body only makes, it produces one ketone, and that's acetoacetate. Mm. And then that acetoacetate gets broken down into acetone, which is a ketone, but it predominantly only produced that acetoacetate. Right. So it makes acetone, which is kind of a, um, a natural uh, degradation product. So it naturally, spontaneously um, becomes uh, acetone. Mm. But there's an enzyme that actively converts acetoacetate into beta-hydroxybutyrate. So, and that's, that's the goal. I mean, that's the whole goal with keto. Right. So. And then, <clears throat> excuse me, some of these fibers that you're talking about eating uh, or, or ha- providing for your stomach, um, 
what does that look like? Like, I know that uh, uh, pe- people have talked about uh, prebiotics and things like that, and um, sometimes the heating and cooling of some of these starchy carbohydrates can result in uh, feeding your gut uh, what it needs. Is that, is that about right? Uh, you can. So you can modulate foods for sure. So, so prebiotics are exactly that. They are for your mic- gut microbiome. That's why, you know, technically lactose is a prebiotic, mm. right? Um, pretty much any indigestible fiber is a prebiotic. So when we talk about fermented foods, like you, you have a better time with fermented foods, right? So um, if I, you, uh, what is it, like oats, you right. know, you leave and put some water in there, warm right. it up and let it go overnight. That's because that fermentation isn't happening in your gut, right? right. And, or in your colon. So you don't get that indigestion or that, you know, build up a gas. But at the same time, the butyrate that's produced from that's getting absorbed in your stomach and not in your colon. Mm. Right. So you're kind of already breaking a lot of it down, which may give you a better time with it, but you're not getting those nutrients Mm. down where you need them. Right. So, um. So what's the solution? What do you eat? Um, uh, luckily my wife is very intelligent and she, you know, does most, most of the meal prep in the house. Mm-hmm. Um, honestly, right now, it's been as simple as adding, uh, I just get straight inulin. Um, mm-hmm. Inulin's a great uh, prebiotic, and we have... Um, just a powder of some sort? It's just a powder. It comes from the... Uh, so the one I get comes from the root of uh, tequiliana agave, mm-hmm. so the tequila plant, um, and I dissolve it in my coffee in the morning, <laughs> and you can't taste it. It's actually, so... How much of that I do like about? I do like... Uh, three, tablespoon three grams day. and okay. it comes with a little measuring scoop. Gotcha. You can get it on Amazon for like five bucks. Um, and honestly, I reduced my bathroom time like half. Wow. Just <laughs> really nice. Um, what do you think it does? Do you think it just kind of like, uh, kind of holds everything together a little bit better? Like, or... well, well that, I mean, I know from experimental data that inulin is going to increase my butyrate production. So I'm going to have a healthier, um, colon, you know, I, Right. Potentially. Um, Shits will be tapered. Right. Mm. Right. Less uh, wiping, less cleanup, yeah. maybe. Does it get rid of the endless crayon? The endless crayon. Just, just, wipe, keep, wipe, just, keep, just wiping keep wiping and it's still there. Um, you know, I haven't had that problem, so maybe. Hmm. Um, but at the same, so I have a little bit of confounding uh, errors. So my daughter has a dairy protein allergy. Um, so we've like removed dairy from my house and soy. So dairy, the, the cow's milk protein and soy protein are very similar. Hmm. Um, and they react similarly. So I've removed that from our household. So I haven't had soy in like <laughs> almost a year. Well, since January. Yeah. So is it a little bit of both? Probably. Yeah. Could be. Um, Cause soy is in everything. Yeah. Can't even buy a can of tuna. That's true. So. Uh, it's in, it ends up being in a lot of stuff. Did you have a chance to listen to the podcast we did with Joel Green? If you didn't no, have a chance, you should. You'd really like it a lot. I mean, he talked a lot about uh, these things that you're talking about. And mm-hmm. he talked about, um, he's got all kinds of weird you know, methods and foods that he eats that he's just, he's studied a lot of these things and he knows like, you know, strawberries do this and cucumbers do that. And he knows very specifically to the point where you're like, and it really, it's really cool to hear somebody talk that way because most of the time someone's like, well, strawberries, you know, it's a fruit and it's got sugar. So they don't tell you, you know, these other facts that he was, uh, he was giving us. And it was really, it was really interesting because he's using, he kind of call it, refers to it as functional food. Yeah. And he, he's utilizing these foods. He's kind of giving them uh, a little bit more of a purpose. And if you think about some of the stuff that you've seen the bodybuilding crowd do for a long time, maybe some of that even makes sense. Like a lot of these guys have been pounding down rice for years. Like maybe maybe that's a prebiotic that they're <laughs> that they're eating. You know, they're heating and cooling and starches, um, sweet potatoes and things like that. I mean, maybe they're... Maybe they're onto some things. There's definitely some uh, some of the FODMAPs in the sweet potatoes for sure, and I'm pretty sure that's why it's in the Monster Mash. Mm-hmm. Um, it's it's a it's a smaller amount. I think it's mannitol, um, but it's still there, right? right? And so and there's a lot of things in, the, in these peppers and stuff in small doses. Um, so I think uh, that was Stan's goal is right. like, uh, reduce them to a point where they're not going to be like, <laughs> yeah, insulting your body basically. Exactly. Right? Um, Do but... you think that there's some foods that we should really avoid? I mean, it, it's you know, um, when, when I think about like, uh, food, I think about, I equate it to training cause that's mm-hmm. the easiest thing for me to equate anything to. And so, um, sometimes in training, um, you know, for a long time, people are talking about sports specific movement and functional movement. And I was like, I've never seen a movement that's not functional. Yeah. Like they're all, like it's all, it. <laughs> it's all okay to do. Like, yeah, like one movement's safer than the other. And it's not a great idea to use large amounts of weight, 
uh, you know, maybe why jamming your knees together and trying to do a squat. However, could you make a case for, can that make you a lot stronger in a squat if you use light weights? Yeah, it certainly could. Like your knees in, knees out, uh, knees straight, knees forward, knees back. I mean, attacking it from all angles is a lot of times the, uh, the kind of best way to do it. And when it comes to food, you know, obviously like if something's going to be like real problematic for, if you send it to the hospital, then there's, you right. wouldn't want to eat that. Right. <laughs> Uh, but other than that, I mean, it seems like even kind of what you're saying is like, uh, even if something makes you gassy or bloated or whatever, maybe that's something that you need to get rid of for a period of time and bring it back in slowly and see how you can, uh, have it be somewhat part of your diet. Right. And that's the, and that, so when you take a, you know, a 3000 view foot look at what's going on is what are these, what does it come down to? Like if, if you start merging all the, uh, information you've gathered over the, you know, the life, your training life. Mm-hmm. Um, looking at diets and looking at, you know, what's, what's good and what's bad. And really, I think the, the best success we've seen with, you know, people getting on the ketogenic diet, even now the carnivore diet, the paleo diet, what is the common denominator? And it's the removal of simple sugars. And I think that in itself has done so much for, um, I mean, uh, for health yeah. and, and especially, and, you know, in the U S but at the same time, so what does an optimal diet look like? You know, what is, what is the optimal human diet look like? And it's, it's, it's variety, right? You have, you have a core base of, we're omnivores, right? You have a core base of animal proteins and you have a ton of vegetables involved. Like, I, yeah. <laughs> like, I don't think the definition of omnivore gets any more, any more yeah. clearer. And, so. and also too, I mean, if you think about you know, if you were to go back, you know, 50 years, 100 years, 200, you know, start to go back in time. One thing with the simple sugars I always like to point out is because people get so crazy about it and like, well, what about flexible dieting? <laughs> and uh, we, we we all have to deal with this coming up. Uh, our buddy Lane Norton is going to be on uh, Joe Rogan soon. So hmm. <laughs> that's going to cause a cascade of problems yeah. too. But this the simple sugars, they're problematic because people are eating them in a crazy abundance. Right. Um, fructose is not really a big problem. Fruit is not really a big problem. Eat but then there's <laughs> something called high fructose corn syrup right. that has ruined the United States in a lot of ways. I mean, I think, I personally think obesity is like the number one, our number one enemy. You know, I don't yeah. think, there's a lot of things, <laughs> there's a lot of problems in the United States. There's, there's plenty of them. And some people are probably disagreeing with me right now. Well, even look at the burden on the healthcare system. Yeah. Like, look, I mean, but our, chil- babies, our children you know. are being threatened and that's yeah. what I don't like because, um, if we think about like terrorism and we think about like war and we think about these things, it's like, I don't, the school shootings are, that's horrific. And that puts our children at great danger, but I don't see anything that puts, uh, the, the number of people and the number of children in danger more so than sugar and corn syrup and all these different things. And again, I'm not blaming just sugar because it's the overabundance of all food, but sugar is the predominant thing that we are enjoying the most. If you leave a child with a choice between, um, you know, you cooking them a a nice healthy dinner and then having something sugary, uh, like even just even say, Hey, you want uh, four granola bars or do you want uh, a chicken potato, uh, and, uh, some broccoli? Right. (laughs) They're going to have a glass of milk and they're going to gnaw down those granola <laughs> bars because they taste delicious, right? Yeah, of course. Because they got peanut butter all over them and they're oh, in man, rich You know how to do it. Yeah. Damn. Well, those Nature Valley bars, dude. The crumbs, crumbs all over them. Oh, yeah. Those are really good. Yeah, they're really good. dry. So dry. <laughs> <laughs> they're really dry, but somehow they're really amazing. Right. We need to get some of those. <laughs> yeah. You can get them at like Winco, like dollar eighty nine. Just cr- just well that's the thing is like, like how every, cheap is that? Yeah. And like how and, and now the problem is like how what do you gotta what do you gotta pay to eat healthy? Yeah. Um luckily my wife's a nutritionist, so mm-hmm. <laughs> you know really she, yeah. Oh, so that's that's great. my wife's a nutritionist for the California Department of Public Health, um, women, infants and children. So um Shit. Yeah. We should have heard, had her and the yeah. meat scientist on. We shouldn't even have you here. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just like this middle guy. <laughs> yeah, like, like microbes are tight. You're, you're just like, regurgitating sh- all the info from the people around you, right? <laughs> like, there's that- these cows. They got holes in them. You guys got to check them out. <laughs> My lab's awesome. It stinks really bad. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. But now, so uh, we've recently been going to. Um, there's this little spot north of Yuba City. It's called the U Pick Farm. So you can go pick your own vegetables. 
Wow, nice. Season, it's all seasonal. It's That's really awesome. Good. It's all, Where it's is it cheap. At? It's uh, it's called Johnson's U Pick. It's in, uh, so it's North Yuba <laughs> City, right <laughs> outside of um, Gridley. That's pretty cool. Yeah, and you just show up. It gives you some baskets. And we're talking like eighty cents a pound for really? like yeah eggplants oh, and whatever That's the hell great. you want. Like we we could Dude, definitely sh- go in there. Shelled my own almonds the other day. <laughs> yeah, that's so, gotta be a pain in the ass. It is a pain in the ass, but it's a great grip strength. Mm-hmm. So like you have, you have to take the holes off, but then you got like break the shells open. Which just your... see things like that are great examples. You know, um, if you were to you know live you know a few hundred years ago and you had to. You know, get some almonds. How mm. many almonds would you eat? Right. <laughs> Six. I'm sitting there like half an hour. My wife's like, no, yeah. we need more than that. You're under a tree. Maybe you'd eat like eight or something. Yeah. But you'd be like, screw this. And it's cheap. It's like, it was like a $1.50 a pound for almonds. Yeah. So, um, you know, cool. it, and we take my, my daughter. So she's like in the my wife's backpack thing, um, carrier deal. Yeah. And my daughter's just like, this, this. Oh, uh, nice. Give me that shit. So um, I picked her own apple. And she like it was crazy because she picked the apple and it immediately went in her mouth, like she just knew like she has two teeth, you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> but she knew that thing was supposed like to go a in her mouth. Savage, like, wow. <laughs> give me that thing. And then she yeah. bites me, like she bit my finger the other day. It's like you're not ready for that yet. <laughs> yeah, I know that's the kind of stuff. Uh, you know, when they're when they're young, it's like you almost gotta like bite them back or you gotta do something crazy. <laughs> like so they're, they, like they, they're dogs. Yes, yeah, <laughs> bite, bite, the bite their ear. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they gotta know like, hey, you can't you can't be doing that yeah. shit. What right. about uh probiotics? Somebody was asking about uh drinking kombucha. Is that um anything beneficial there? Um <laughs> uh we'll start with kombucha and then go into actual probiotics. Yeah, so there are live cells, you know, in kombucha. Um really what it comes down to is a lot of these probiotics at you know our stage of development, there's a huge role for probiotics in infants. Um, what we're seeing now is that infants, there's, a, there's actually a startup in Davis called Evolved Biosystems, mm-hmm. um, and they study the gut, gut microbiome of infants, right? And if, because if you don't have that proper gut microbiome, your immune system's not going to develop correctly, and we're starting to learn more and more about that. Um, and they're starting to formulate probiotics with prebiotics Right to mm. make sure that they take hold, <clears throat> but for us, our, our, our microbiome's established. So what you're trying to do is you're, you're giving you're giving you know in most times a freeze dried or spore form of uh, of an organism, and you're saying survive, <laughs> you know, and you're throwing it in the ring with in, in, if its food's there, it might survive for a minute, you know, and then it's going to be gone. Right. right. It's going to be outcompeted because it can't take a hold. It doesn't have its nutrient source there, you know, and everything out, everything there is soaking up all the, uh, the nutrients. So, um, I, th- I'm yet to find one that I'm like, I'm going to take that. I'm, yeah. micro- I'm as a microbiologist, just like, if there was a probiotic out there that I was like this, mm-hmm. I'd probably be taking it. Yeah. And they try to, I mean, they try to have, you know, healthier versions that are more stable and like yeah. they try to. They try to do all kinds of things. Um, what about when people actually make some of the stuff themselves? Mm. Does so like, that have maybe like, a little bit more merit to it? Like yogurt? Yeah. So I think the great thing about yogurt is you're going to eat that every day, right? And you're going to get it. So it, it, it's it's a probiotic and a prebiotic, right? It has its food source there because that's what it grew in. And it has the organisms there. Mm. And they're usually in pretty pretty significant abundance. And uh, the organisms that so produce- So in yogurt, yogurt maybe it's surviving- Pretty well. Right. Um, And the organisms that are in yogurt are actually really hearty. Um, So like lactobacillus bulgaricus, that thing, that's why, you know, it's really sour, Mm -hmm. you know, like your Greek yogurts is because that thing can survive at really low pHs, right? Right. It can tolerate a lot of acid. Um, So if anything's going to have a easier time, you know, taking root, it's going to be one of those. Right. But even then, if your diet doesn't complement Mm. that organism it's it's no way it's going to survive which is the case with the american public and and they're they're just seeing constant yogurt commercials and they think they're doing themselves like, fuck, something yeah great. right dannon you know i'm like what is dannon yeah <laughs> i don't want them to sue me don't sue me yeah um also disclaimer uh, <laughs> uh anything i say is not a representative of the university of california um there we go that in there that's all i need um, you know you think about it it's almost the equivalent of like you go in you exercise real hard and you go outside and you smoke a cigarette and you drink a beer Right. It's like uh, you're not doing other things that are conducive towards your health. So this probiotic concept is probably, I would just say, it's probably a waste of time. In a lot of cases, yeah. 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 Because if you're, if you don't follow up, there's, there's no point. Um, If you have a stomach problem and, and you like it, 
and it seems like it's helping awesome. and, and you have a diet that's conducive towards fixing other things and maybe stick with it. Really? I mean, in the, and when I can, when I find, you know, a great study that shows like, here's the organism, here's the person before they started taking pre- the probiotic, here's their, you know, uh, their stool now and, you know, how many cells are in there? Mm-hmm. Like, it has it taken root? How long after they stop taking that probiotic is that organism going to be in there? When I see something like that, I'll be on board. And right. there's probably like some internet warriors on there that are like, oh, it's the one I take is the best. Yeah, yeah. You know, if, yeah, send it to I me. I make my okay. own yogurt, bro. <laughs> <laughs> I make my own beer. Um, that's nice. not probiotic. <laughs> that's the anti So, I mean, the other thing, too, about yogurt, uh, let's not forget uh, it has calcium. Yeah. And let's not forget it's got protein. So, yeah. it's not like... It's not like you. It's not like you're doing anything bad to yourself, especially oh, no. if you're not getting ones that are loaded with a lot of sugar. Oh yeah, hundred percent. And you can make so it's so easy to make your own yogurt. So just take some milk, take some powdered milk. Leave it on the counter for a couple of days. <laughs> no, it's not hot enough. So take take the yogurt you like, put a dollop of that into your milk plus milk powder, you know, mm. powdered milk mixture, and it needs to be about thirty seven degrees. Let it sit for like a day. And you got more yogurt. Really? Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah. I mean, the same thing. That's, that's what's happening with your oatmeal, right? Mm-hmm. You put the water in there, put some, if you have yeast yeah. in there, whatever, whatever organisms are there, and they're just going to ferment a little yeah, bit. Yeah, I and... think I uh, usually dump like a little bit of, uh, I, well, I sometimes put lemon juice in there, or sometimes I put like apple cider vinegar. Hmm. Really? Th- that was mainly to break it down. I don't think it was to cause more growth. Growth of so, anything. So you're not, maybe but I'm... I could put yogurt in it. Yeah. I mean, so you're not really, you're not really fermenting it. No, you're uh, just you're just using no. the acid to break down mm-hmm. uh, the oats, yeah. Right, because I have like you know the oats that take like twenty minutes to cook. Right, <laughs> they, they take forever. Fucking rolled oats, yeah, yeah, it's crazy. I, the, I I can uh, I can leave them on the stove for so long, and it's amazing. I never understand like how big they get. <laughs> like, I, <laughs> what is an oat? Like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's huge. <laughs> it's like this huge amount of food every single time. Like, it's like an entire pot worth of oatmeal. I'm like, how did that happen? You get one of those Instapots? And people get all excited about like the quick oats, but I'm like, man, you're really missing out because like the quick oats, you could have, you could have four little things of, of quick oats and it wouldn't equate to the half cup that I'm having of these regular oats because they end up swelling up so much. Right. So my, that's like, that's my daughter's go-to breakfast food right now. Yeah. Steel cut oats and uh, peaches. That's, yeah. That's what she wants for breakfast. You know, and anybody out there listening that, that's checking this out, anybody that's got kids, kids love fruit. You know, get them some fruit <laughs> mm-hmm. or find fruits that they like. I think the important Even a little part bit is... of fruit juice, as long as it doesn't have, you know, a bunch of extra shit in it. Yeah. Uh, it's totally fine. It just, it doesn't have to be, you know, this size. It doesn't have to be a 24 ounce cup of juice. Six ounces, eight ounces. They're going to be usually plenty satisfied with that. And here's the, like the, the horrible part is like my daughter's at that age where like she's investigating stuff now. So part of me is like. You want to try this Sour Patch Kid? Like, what if I? What are you gonna do if I put this Sour Patch Kid? Yeah, in my zing. Mouth? Yeah, it's like, oh my god! And my wife's just like, get off! You know, like, fuck out of here! Yeah, <laughs> like you can't do that. It's gonna. And I think that's that's up. uh that's what people should try to do the most with their children because it's like, look, you got a whole life ahead of you of being unhealthy, <laughs> you got a whole life ahead of you of making really dumb decisions. For now, like, we're I'm gonna, gonna make. I'm gonna try not to get up for you. We're gonna make the dumb decisions for you right now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You try to con- try to control it the best you can. You know, we were talking uh, yesterday um, and the last time on this podcast too about even just the very act of having like a kids menu. It's kind right. of absurd. You're like, well, kids don't need different food. <laughs> it's not like it's not like you're sitting there with a freaking giraffe or something, or you're sitting there with a fucking snake and it needs yeah. to eat mice and everybody else is eating spaghetti and meatballs or whatever. It's just a kid, right? And they can right. eat. They're a small human. Yeah, they're just a small... Just <laughs> human a sm- menu. <laughs> yeah, just a smaller version of you, right? And obviously, like, yeah, maybe a kid wants something less complicated to eat. Maybe, you know, maybe them sitting there trying to chop up a filet mignon is a little bit... I'm uh, not going to give a kid a filet mignon anyway. They're not going to appreciate it. Yeah. <laughs> give me, give me <laughs> that Give me that back. You get, you get top sirloin because you can tell the difference. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> and that's, I think that's a huge problem is like, yeah... You see these all these people like buying steaks on steaks, you know, like I'm, I'm going to buy six tri tips today. Like that's three cows worth of tri tips. <laughs> There's only two tri tips on a cow. Like, really? Yeah. Wow. Shit. You know, so uh, you know your TFL muscle. Mm-hmm. That's the tri tip on a cow, right? So that uh, was uh, the thing that was all striated on Sean Roden. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> he would have a delicious. He would have a delicious uh, tri tip. 
I don't know if you saw the uh, Mr. Olympia contest this year, but Sean Roden beat um, uh, Phil Heath. Mm. And, uh, you know, these guys, they look, oh, they look amazing. You know, the striations in the quads and, and uh, the hamstrings, but, like, he had, like, this side thing that was just hanging off the, the side of his hip flexor. A big triangle. of Yeah, that was yeah. just striated. <laughs> and it's like, whoa. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and it's like. I mean, yeah. I've seen that before on some bodybuilders, but this guy's probably 250, you know, 260 Jeez. pounds. On, look at this, the thickness of that leg. <laughs> it's insane. And, I, and then how does the waist so small? What's going on? Seriously. 43 years old. Good. <laughs> well, I got, what do I got? I got some years. I got 10 years? years? To go. I'll get there. I'll get there. How many years? Uh, <laughs> how old are you? I'm 28. 28. A youngster. Yeah, a youngster, young guy. You have time to train. You've been at. You've been. Uh... Yeah. So um, I hit the gym this morning. Um... You set any world records or anything? No. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing big happened. <laughs> not, not this morning. No. Damn. Not a lot. Not a lot happens at fucking three a.m. Uh, <laughs> but but are you uh, training out at three a.m. at your house? No. So I train at an Ironborn Strength in Yuba City. Uh, Ron Strahan's gym. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Um, just key card access. Yeah. It's great because oh. It's an awesome facility that he's got. It's it's pretty intense. It's awesome, man. He got everything. A little dirty. It's a little. It's <laughs> I a don't little. Mind. It's a little dirty, but he. Uh, I love all the old shit that he's got. Oh yeah, those York dumbbells. And he got. loves showing you that shit. He's like, check this out. He's like a savant when it comes to that stuff. He's a hoarder. Yeah, <laughs> just bad. So all that I was telling Mark, like all that shit used to be in his garage, like all of it, mm -hmm. and it was like spilling out into like his front yard and then they had to call like the homeowners association <laughs> they got a fine for it that's <laughs> but, awesome yeah we used to train out of his garage and like it was a great time um 3 a.m huh 3 a.m um so my i mean i go to bed at like eight i put my daughter down at eight o'clock um get up at th you know 2 30 get my shit together get a pot of coffee um eat anything or just um usually not before not mm -hmm. before training um, just drink a whole pot of coffee yeah <laughs> Yeah, uh, <laughs> it's a pot of it's at least a pot of coffee a day. Yeah, um, which probably isn't great for me, but um, it's actually done a lot for me. Not the coffee, but training at three a.m. Yeah. Um, so I put my daughter to bed, and my wife gets up um, at five to get ready for work. So I've got like this two-hour window where I can go train. She's so lazy. <laughs> I'm waking up at five, but she's so <laughs> right. So right now she's staying up late because she's working on her masters. So she's got to got to do her homework and shit. Um, Damn. Yeah, I know. She's a hustler. Uh, I don't know the fuck she's doing with me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I got her. Uh, <laughs> trapped. You keep her locked in, right? Right. Um, she fucking hated me when we first met. But That happens a lot. It really, like, she thought I was a complete douche. She was like, this guy's. And then she fell guys. in love with it. She's like, this guy's so arrogant. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. <laughs> when I first met her, like, we went hiking. Did she think you were arrogant or cocky or something? Or just, Pretty much. Or just yeah. thought you were standoffish like, or something? My, the first minute I could, I took my shirt off. Like, this is how I'm going to get, I got, That's it, it's like, it was like programmed human nature. Like, I got to show her because otherwise I'm not going to see her again. She's yeah. not going to know she's missing out. <laughs> and at that time I was still like a hundred, I was probably 175 pounds. Yeah. So it's like, I didn't nothing to show. It's great. <laughs> just uh, setting the bait out there. <laughs> yeah. And so I just kept, you know, hounding her and then here we are. It was just like. Where were you that you took your shirt off? <laughs> I was, uh, so we went hiking this place called, uh, I think it's. Uh, fairy falls up in wheatland um nice little waterfall up there cool there, i didn't go swimming there was no reason for me to take my shirt off <laughs> it's awesome but i had to you're like whoo isn't it hot up here and people are like <laughs> no up? it's 65 degrees she was so <laughs> wrong about you yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's right uh, but then you know here we are like seven years later I'm like fuck yeah so i tell her that i'm like you don't know you don't even know what you did. What she, happened? She probably she probably every day is regretting. Her <laughs> yeah, like I should have trusted my intuition. Right. Yeah. Like just cut this guy out. But so are there? Uh, are, I don't know. We probably not allowed to talk about this, but are there human beings with holes in their side too somewhere? So there are. Oh no, there are. Um, and I think uh, a lot of it isn't for research purposes. I think it's a lot of it's like medical intervention. Mm. Um, but I think oh, they I can. See. I think they can use them. Like. Yeah. They, Got a hole in you, know, like what's up? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hey, let's try this out. Let's see what's I, going on. Can I get some of that? Let me see your gut <laughs> microbiome. Right. Um, but that's what you know. That's why we're using pigs because pigs are a lot. Uh, it was, there's a lot of great validity to the mice models that we have now. Mm -hmm. um, they've been studied very in depth, and they're I think they're a pretty great standard model. Um, but if we can try to make a better model, we will. Um, so that's what we you know 
were utilizing the pig gut um, because they're monogastric. Um, they're pretty much omnivores. Um, their digestive system is similar to ours. So, hmm. you know, give it a shot, see if it's any closer. What's something that you're real excited about that you've uh, been kind of poking around with? Uh, Anything kind of new or in the last couple of years that like maybe something that even just surprised you where you you ran a study, you're like, oh, I ain't going to work and freaking just total opposite of what you thought or, or has, has there been any research or science that has been just quite a bit different than what you expected? Man, that's heavy. Um, you know, I haven't taken a step back and looked at it like that. Um, I will say that the, the expansion of, uh, metagenomics that we, as we see it now is just, it's unreal. Um, what are metagenomics? So metagenomics <laughs> is. Sounds like a rap or something. <laughs> <laughs> a way of rapping metagenomics. Yeah. So it's, uh, it's the, the genomics, the genetic content of a community. So if you have your whole microbiome, I can, I can extract and sequence all the DNA in it. And then I can go on the back end in what we call in silico on a computer and I can try to reassemble it and map it to what we know, mm. right? The genes that we know, their functions, things like that. So I can understand who's there, like what microorganisms are there, but what do they have the genetic capacity to do? You know, what enzymes do they produce? Things like that. Um, and now, we're, oh, man, because yeah, honestly, <laughs> it was probably like 15 years ago, we were at, we were pretty much at the base. Like we were you know, amplify one gene at a time, maybe like, and it, right. that was a feat. Like it was like, you got a whole gene out. Like that's dope. Right. And now we're generating millions and millions of, uh, of reads, um, and assembling entire genomes of organisms all in like one shot. So, um, you know, we have this uncultured 99%. And when you look at where we've gotten with this 1%, so the 1% we do know about, like every, everything we rely on is, comes from that 1%. Like all the biotechnology that we've, that we utilize today is that 1%. Mm. Every, pretty much everything about medicine wouldn't have been possible without anti antibiotics, right? right? Our understanding of germ theory, clean water, like what makes clean water clean? <laughs> the absence of microorganisms, right? And these, you know, that 1% has led to <laughs> the, the largest increase in the human lifespan as we've seen it to date. Yeah. Um, and so what that 99% holds is really, I mean, that's why I'm in it because there's something there yeah. that, and I want to, I want to name an organism. So <laughs> it's like naming a planet, huh? Right. Like, but there's like, I guess there's billions of planets too. Do you but... think there's like maybe some sort of technology coming our way where we could, or, or is there any technology where you could rid yourself of disease by, by something in the stomach, you know, like a, could you, could you, uh, possibly like, get like inoculated for like a common cold or something you need, where you never get a common cold because there's something in your stomach where you never, you never get a flu. You never have fucking diarrhea or like, right. you know, I, so I, I don't know. <laughs> what you, what you mentioned is so the influenza virus. So H1M, like things like H1M1, swine flu, things like that. Mm -hmm. They change every year. They mutate. Right. And the They're way we, up the way them. we target them, um, right now is pretty, uh, it's kind of old school. Um, we're targeting a specific region of this virus. Um, and a lot of times we fail, you know, we mess it. You, you hear every year like, Oh, we weren't very good on the, um, uh, the vaccine this year. Right. Um, yeah. And it still gets through and it still gets tons of people sick. Right. That kind of thing. The, 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 the original influenza virus. Right. Yeah, correct. Right, right. Um, but even, even getting some a vaccine, um, even if it doesn't have total coverage, so what we call coverage, um, you, it still gives you some immunity, right? You can still partially uh, identify an organism, but they mutate at such an incredible rate. Um, so you can't nail it. And that's the problem with the common cold. Mutates. At a, there's many things that give you colds. Yeah. It's not just like, that's the cold virus, right? And there's many things that give you like traveler's diarrhea, right? That's a, what we typically assign to what we call rhinoviruses. Um, so we call Stan Efferding virus. Yeah, I was going to say, he's, <laughs> he's had that before. He told me about it one time in Panama. Huh. Yeah, I'm sure he has. Um, mm -hmm. And then, you know, these things, they're so small. There's nothing to them. There's, it's a couple of genes, right? Mm -hmm. They encode for themselves and that's it. They get in there, they put themselves in your DNA and they're yeah. like, make me. Um, right. So it's, but when you look at our DNA as humans, like there's viruses in our DNA that are just dormant that 
you know, millennia. You know, they've just been there as, as long as we've been evolving. So they're, I think they're an incredible part of our gene pool. So to say, like, I, we can't, what would happen if we eliminated that genetic diversity mm -hmm. um, that's being yeah. added yeah. by, by these things? And the things like, like the mitochondria, mm -hmm. that was a free living organism. And we were like, that's pretty dope. Like, you do cool stuff. You want to come be a part of me? <laughs> <laughs> like, you can burn fats and make tons of energy. Like, you can make me run. What about, uh, you know, sometimes people refer to the stomach as uh, the second brain. Yeah. And um, is there any hope to be able to do anything with, like, m uh, mental health illness, uh, depression, anxiety, kind of through the stomach? Um, have you seen any research with um, people eating certain types of diets that help them uh, maybe kind of steer themselves out of anxiety, depression. I, I just keep hearing that over and over again. There's so many people that are right. suffering from, from this. So, um, I actually just read it. I sent this one to you too. Um, but it's yeah, read it right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was the first case of looking at the, uh, um, for in this case, the role of the ketogenic diet in like alcohol. Um, and then there was another study on the, the uh, microbiome on the reward circuitry of the brain. And so like cocaine at it. So people who are addicted to cocaine. Um, so for, for that study, what they do is they wipe out the microbiome of these mice. They just dose them with antibiotics, like what we call uh, bazooka mycin or Godzilla psyllin. Just wipe them out. And then you give them a bunch of coke. <laughs> Here you go, mouse. Uh, <laughs> Check this out, bro. Yeah, and but you can you can measure the transcripts in the brain that encode for um, di your reward circuitry. Um, and what they found is, so if you if your gut microbiome is wiped out, your reward circuitry is jacked up. It's oh, you know, it's over. Uh, you're overproducing these transcripts that lead to um, this reward system. Like, yeah. So maybe this is why uh, this makes sense. Um, once I got done with my bodybuilding show. And I was like depleted of everything. And I was, uh, you know, feeling like shit, basically. Uh, this guy, Joel Green, that came on the podcast, he had me uh, really hit the reward circuits hard, basically just eating a lot and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, nailing. He kind of had me eat certain types of food so it wasn't uh, too much of an influx of like bloating and, and hurt my stomach and make right. me uh, sit on the toilet all day long. But he's intentionally hitting those rewards um, in a way that was... Uh, I guess causing such a release of other hormones like dopamine and mm -hmm. some of these other things uh, that it was causing a lot of positive effects. Normally people would say, well, overeating and eating junk is going to be you know, primarily all negative. <laughs> There's a reason why we do it. <laughs> but in this case, it was, it was very positive in, in a bunch of different ways. So um, I think the, the key part of that, uh, the cocaine study is when they, they took these mice that they, you know, they were giving them coke um, and then they wiped out their microbiome, when they micro wiped out their microbiome, mm -hmm. They added back in short chain fatty acids, and that stopped that that promotion of the uh, reward circuitry. Wow! So you have this interplay between the gut microbiome and this. I mean, rewards. I mean, you're seeing the same thing with sugar. I believe so. Sugar also, you know, inhibits that reward circuitry. Like, oh, that was great. Let's do it again. What's a? Sh I know you've said this a bunch, but what's a short chain fatty acid? A short chain fatty acid is like acetate and propionate. So they're very right. similar to like beta hydroxybutyrate. They're short, like uh, four carbons long. Um, little uh, uh, what you 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 assimilate like a carboxylic acid end. Um, right. But you can kind of only make those through your the microbiome. digestion of carbohydrates. Right. So gotcha. uh, okay. predominantly the Fermentation of carbohydrates is how those are produced. So they added back in the short chain fatty acids, and you don't have that reward circuitry amped up like you do with that with your wiped out microbiome. Um, so, as an aside, the uh, the alcohol thing when you when you're ingesting a ton of alcohol, your body's making a ton of uh, acetate. Right? So your body, your brain is getting used to metabolizing acetate as well. So. What happens is if you get on a ketogenic diet while you're detoxing from alcohol, then you're supplying your brain with the same type of, uh, of fuel source as it would have had if it was on, you know, if it was producing alcohol or if it was you were ingesting alcohol. So if that transition period, if, you, if you're going to have someone come off of alcohol, I don't know how, you know, cooperative they're going to be, but if you can get them to switch to a ketogenic diet, that it looks like there's pretty good promise in utilizing mm -hmm. that. And it, it's been shown to decrease, uh, it's irritability, irritability and rigidity, not all, you know, you're not going to, 
You know, yeah, it's not cure, a, not cut a it down, but it's not a cure. Yeah. Right, but it can mitigate. It does seem like it can cure, right. mitigate some of the symptoms. It worked for my brother. Did, yeah. Doing the ketogenic diet, yeah. and coming off alcohol. Yeah, yeah, it worked for my brother. My brother, my brother went to a place called Cliffside Malibu, where they. Um, it's a beautiful place. It's in Malibu, California, which yeah. is unbelievable. It doesn't be. get much better than that, right? Um, the facility's really nice. And, you know, they could probably do better with their food, but they have, they got fruit, they got vegetables, they got meat. Um, occasionally they have like pizza and different things like that. But as he started to go through uh, treatment, he started to just eat healthier and healthier. He's like, this just makes sense. They want me to go for a walk. They want me to exercise. I'm going to all these meetings. Um, you know, I got all this extra shit that I have to do every day to make myself better. I'm also just eat better as well. And this is what I always try to preach is addition by subtraction. If I keep adding and adding to your life, then uh, you're not going to have a choice but to start to subtract things out. If I tell you, hey, man, you know, on top of waking up at 3 a.m., I need you to start going on two 10-minute uh, walks every day. I need you to have two servings of vegetables every day, two servings of fruit every day. I need you to drink more water. I need you to get more sleep. And you're like, shit, man. By the yeah. time I do that, hanging out with my wife and kids and go to work, I ain't got time for a bowl of ice cream, right? I don't yeah. have time for this. Mm -hmm. And if you do have so time for something, maybe it's just not as uh, not as bad as, as what you would normally do. But yeah, my brother started to eat better and better and uh, he got on a uh, kind of war on carbs diet, a right, ketogenic right. diet, yeah. and uh, he was able to kick alcohol, and that was probably almost five years ago. Yeah. And then he's just kind of gotten deeper and deeper uh, into the keto diet, going all the way into uh, the carnivore diet. Mm. Something that I noticed, which is really weird, was going through that bodybuilding uh, program, which it was only eight weeks. So yeah. <laughs> I never want to like sit here and, you know, claim I'm a bodybuilder. I, I did a, uh, a bodybuilding diet for eight weeks um, and, and that's all I know of it. But uh, it completely killed cravings. It, it crushed them. I mean, now it's like, now I, I kind of just understand like right now for me to weigh 240, 245, which is about where my weight's at. I have to, I, ha I don't have to, I choose to eat a little bit of junk because I know I'm going to be on some bullshit diet <laughs> any minute now to, to cut back down and stuff again yeah. anyway. So I'm just kind of, I'm taking my time with it a little bit, um, but it really killed a lot of cravings that I had before. But the weird, weird thing is, is, and I, I was never a big drinker anyway, but it totally killed alcohol. Mm. I just don't even, I just. Fuck that. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Isn't that weird? Isn't that weird? But it, it, it's, um. It's probably similar to what you're saying with the ketogenic diet and, and alcohol. There's there's something there that like, um, and even the bodybuilding uh, itself, getting so involved in one thing and going so far one way, you think that you would swing back harder the other way. Right. But you really don't. You're like, no, man, this is the path I'm going on. You don't, when, you, when I was doing the bodybuilding stuff, I've never had a feeling like that before. You don't care about anything else. I don't even like bodybuilding. <laughs> <laughs> I don't really. I like I like the training. I yeah. like getting a pump. I love, you know, I love doing some chest and some biceps and some back and that kind of stuff. I mean, who doesn't? We all love to like bro out. It's yeah. fun, right? Oh, yeah. The exercise is fun. It's hard to breathe heavy. It's fun fun to sweat. It's fun to work hard. But I don't really love it the way I love like powerlifting, you know? But it was the one time in my life where I was like, This is what I'm doing. And I'm like going <laughs> going dead on to this. And and each week it got more intense. It was crazy. Yeah. The deeper I got in, the deeper I was in. It, you know? <laughs> Crazy. So at least, so I was going to ask you, so what's, what's, what's next? What's next is, uh, still just, you know, training hard and, and, uh, you know, trying to move around some big weights and get stronger, get a little bit bigger and just kind of see from here. I'm not really sure exactly what it will, what it will end up looking like. Um, I feel good. I feel really good. I feel strong. Um, staying in good shape. I think, you know, put very simply, uh, Jesse Burdick, uh, always has really good advice for me. And he just said yesterday, I was like, yeah, I don't really don't have a goal, which, you know, I don't really care, but I almost always have some sort of goal in mind right. and almost always start to shoot towards something. And he goes, well, just eat until you don't really have abs anymore. And he goes, and then when that time comes, just eat and get your abs back. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, all right, you fair to, enough. You have to get stray away from the goal to, so you can re train for it again. That's right. right. Yeah. So what's next for Slingshot? Uh, we're doing a lot of stuff here. We got a lot of projects we're working on. Um, it's a great facility. 
by thank the way. You, everyone, thank everyone, you. Yeah, Steve showed me around. Yeah. Here. It's pretty dope here. <laughs> yeah, it's, pre it's pre pretty awesome, man. You're going to have to come by more often and uh, get some training sessions in, but um we got some new stuff going on with power magazine which i'm really excited about we're, we're taking power magazine more uh more digital or just completely digital we've had right. the magazine for about eight or nine years yeah, yeah and uh, first came out and uh you know it's not a you know some people might think oh it's you know dead because it's you know print or whatever it's that's part of it um but it's it's more of a positive thing it's gonna we're gonna add to it we're not gonna it's not like it's not like it's going away and you're not going right. to see it again. You're going to see it more and people are going to uh, know about it a lot more. It just became kind of the thing where it didn't seem like there was a huge need for it in the marketplace anymore. And, uh, you know, over a period of time, uh, the Internet, people, social media, those that's how people are getting, you know, that's how right. people are seeing Larry Wheels hit his big lifts. <sighs> And some of these other freaks out there, right? That's how people are learning <laughs> about the vertical diet. They're watching right. Stan Efferding's uh, Instagram. And they're checking out different people's YouTube channels and stuff. And so we're going to provide a, uh, a digital platform um, that's going to allow people to gather and extract information from a lot of places. And I think one thing that I think uh, that we'll be able to execute well on is we'll be able to get a lot of uh, information to people, be able to get a lot of entertainment to people. But I also think that... Um, a lot of these kind of younger people uh, need to be like mentored a little bit. It's not going to be it's not going to be me that's going to like mentor everybody, um, but it's going to be through this just kind of publication and through this online uh, thing that you're going to get that will have uh, diet, will have programming, it'll have all this kind of stuff. And so I'm really excited about that. As we were laying it out yesterday, and as we were coming up with more concepts and ideas, I was like, "This is going to people are going to really dig this because it's going to provide you with a lot." Are you going to expand to more than powerlifting? Um, in the beginning, it's going to, it's going to primarily, uh, stick to strength sports. Okay. So right. it could be, it could be powerlifting. That's, then um, that's what, that's what I mean. I mean yeah. I stay in strength sports. <laughs> yeah. 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 It could be powerlifting, could be, uh, you know, some strong man and, you know, some representation of some, uh, bodybuilding and maybe a little CrossFit or something, but probably primarily, uh, powerlifting, a uh, strong man. Weightlifting is a little, um, it's been a tough one to crack. Yeah. So I don't know how much we'll do with weightlifting. I, I, I don't know. Serious. I don't know why it's so weird, but it is. It's very. <laughs> I don't think those guys laugh. No, I've never seen one laugh before. No, or smile. Haven't. No, they don't. They're just having a fucking terrible time. It, it's because it's <laughs> sports so hard. Yeah. You ever try one of those lifts? You're <laughs> yeah. impossible. No, I don't because like, they're terrible. Your <laughs> knee or ankle or yeah. something. You like rip. <laughs> I, you like rip something off. Like the the only time I get in a snatch position is like stretch my shoulders out to go do something else, <laughs> <laughs> like with a stick. So. And then uh, with Slingshot, like, we're just always making new stuff. We made a new pair of wraps the other day, a uh, new pair of just wrist wraps. I mean, as if, as if you needed to wrap your wrist any harder than you <laughs> already do, but uh, that's the tightest I ever wrapped my wrist before. And I was like, holy shit. I was like, I don't even know if this is necessary, but. <laughs> what I need what I need is, so I want to be able to hold a uh, farmer's handle and then wrap my fucking hand, arm, my wrist so tight that I can't open my hand. Yeah. So I don't have to worry about dropping farmers anymore. Yeah, that's what will happen. You wrap your wrist so hard that you, yeah, you're you're just making a fist the whole time, you know? <laughs> that's the goal. But, uh, you know, it's really awesome to have, like, the team that we have because we can sit down in some of these meetings and we can chat about a couple ideas and, you know, it, it's not me every day pushing it along, which it was before, which was, like, just... I, I'm Exhausting. Just like, yeah. I, I just don't even want to talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> it was uh, it was a pain in the balls. It was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun doing it all. But uh, man, is it nice to have other people? And then also too, they they give input, and then yeah. products become better. You know, and so that's something I had to kind of learn over a period of time. Like, hey, you know, don't hoard all this shit. Like, let other people have input on it, and uh, they'll be more vested in in wanting to see the product come to life too, because they'll be like, oh shit, that was. That was awesome because that was kind of part of my idea, you yeah. know, and, and now a whole team becomes part of it, ends up being uh, way different things. So super excited about all that. It's crazy. Yeah. You just kind of like mention it to someone like, oh, fuck, I know how to fix that. Like, <laughs> Yeah. Like we could totally do this. And I'm like, oh, this just solved like six months worth of work. Well, it's awesome. <laughs> like, I'm sure it's the same being in your lab, you know, if somebody will say, oh man, that'd be kind of neat if we could do that. And someone else would be like, yeah, we could do that. Yeah. And you're like, what? No, uh -huh. we could, yeah, no, we could actually do that. We could study that tomorrow. Yeah. Like we could start doing that and somebody would be like, oh my God, okay, cool. 
And next thing you know, you're off and running and you're doing it, right? Yeah. And sometimes it, it's a pain in the ass because <laughs> <laughs> you have a lot of great ideas and, you know, we're, you know, we're, we're definitely a growing lab, but, uh, it's, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely learning a lot about like, uh, management delegation, um, and then learning how to just look forward. Mm -hmm. So from my boss, I mean, dude's got ideas and sometimes he's like, Hey, we're going to do this next. I'm like, fuck how? Like what? <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> like, he's like, yeah, we just figured out <laughs> like, okay. But I, you know, it's a, it's a great place to be right now. Um, especially I mean, in my career is just right. learning all the time. I mean, we're at the cutting edge of a lot of this stuff. So I think a lot of people that are, uh, that are young, um, I think they kind of enjoy like somebody saying, Hey, like, this is what we're going to do. And they might think, Oh shit, like, how are we going to do that? But I think, uh, somebody kind of put in their lap and say, Hey, Andrew, like, I want, I want to do this. And then him going, Oh, shit, I don't know how, okay. Uh, I'm not going to say anything. I'm going to go try to Google it or figure it out. <laughs> and then you go try to figure it out and, and you shit, you figure it out, right? Yeah, you right. figure it out. And sometimes, well, not sometimes all the time, it should work out that the person that is doing the job that you ask them to do, they should be able to do a way better job than you could ever do it, you know? <laughs> right. And that's why you hire people. And that's what, that's what will happen over time. And I always tell people, you have to understand. And I was trying to tell this to a family member. He owns a, a, a company that uh, DJs like weddings and mm -hmm. things like that. And he does a lot of it hands on. And he's the guy, you know, putting everything together and breaking everything down at night. And I was like, man, you got to get other people to do like, that's cool that you like that. He said, it's one of his favorite parts of the job. I said, well, shit, that's great. Um, but you know, you're leaving some of these places at 12 o'clock, you're getting home at one o'clock and then to try to start your next day and he likes to work out in the morning. I'm like, man, that's just too much. You know, <laughs> as you get to be 40 and so on, it's just, uh, it's a lot. Right. So, uh, I was coaching him through it and I said, Hey, you, you have to understand when you pass something off to somebody, you have to understand they could do a better job than you. Like, like understand that as a possibility. He's like, wait, I have to understand and accept this possibility that they'll do a worse job than me. No, no, no. <laughs> you have to understand that they could do a, it, they might do it different and you might look at it and go, oh, I, I, I don't know about that, but give it some time. Maybe that different way that they're doing it, maybe it's going to be better. Right. And that was, that was a major, um, I wouldn't do it that way. What's he <laughs> doing? <laughs> Stop it. Just relax. <laughs> Watch it happen. This is the way you do. No. Um, so, <laughs> and that was, that was definitely a major transition I had to make, you know, from doing everything on my own, you know, like I, my, my whole thesis was just like, I, I just was picture you with a beaker and just a bunch of smoke going off and got the glasses on. <laughs> Definitely don't want any smoke going on when there's mercury around. That'd, <laughs> that'd be the death. Um, <laughs> but just, you know, the whole project. Mercury like, and methane. Yeah. That's my whole life right now. Uh, and iron. Um, just everything by myself. And now, you know, I have a, a, a great team, you know, um, PhD students, undergrad kids that are just like willing and ready to rock and roll. And it's like, okay, you can have this, <laughs> but, yeah. and then just kind of like sit back and watch. And then, and a lot of the times it's just like, go fail at this a couple of times. Yeah. We'll talk suck. about it. But after that, it's like, man, I don't have to do that anymore. Like I can have this person do this and they can be like the boss of that. Like they can totally take control of this. And how great is that? They're right. 23, 24 or whatever, 25 years old. Right. Yeah. And just like, and, and it makes me feel good because I'm setting them up in their career, you know, giving them a, a specialty, um, you know, something that they're, they're going to specialize in and be able to take that to another lab and to another job. So they have a skill set to be a leader, which you can put anywhere. Right. If you have a skill set to just do A, B and C that somebody else tells you to do every single time, it right. might not be a skill set that is, uh, uh, going to lead you to be more successful. Right. It's I mean, kind of be in the same spot. There's a, there's a role for people, you know, if I just ask you to do something. Like, no, like, your role is shut your mouth. <laughs> like, do this for me. Like, in some things I just need done. Like, mm -hmm. pretty terrible at organization. Yeah. <laughs> My lab notebook is uh, out it's of empty. control. It's empty. Uh, yeah, well. Oh, yeah. okay. Um, but uh, as part of a team, like, I don't want to just say, like, do it this way, this way, this way, this way. This. I, I need you to be a free thinker. I need you to, you know, come up with ideas. Otherwise, you're, you're just kind of bringing us down. So... What about, uh, last, last, uh, question, unless Andrew has a couple more, oh, yeah. but, uh, Andrew and I have been talking a lot on the podcast lately about sleep. Yeah. Seen anything with sleep, uh, affecting the gut and effect, affecting the stomach and things like that? As far as research is concerned, I haven't, I haven't got into the sleep microbiome stuff. Um, 
It's you're knee deep in cows. I'm, yeah, or elbow at <laughs> least. I'm gonna say shoulder, elbow. Yeah, <laughs> elbow is about as far as I get. The cannula is not. I mean, it's. I need to use the restroom real quick. But right yeah. back, you can keep talking. Sure. Um, the cannula is not not big enough for to I'll, get to get too much far. I was watching it on YouTube right now, and I I genuinely my stomach was like, ooh, I should probably not watch this right now. So what? Uh, usually, what we do is we get a big PVC pipe. Oh jeez. And uh, you drill holes in it. So it's called a transphonation Ooh. tube. And then you put it down into that hole mm-hmm. and you just use a big syringe. Oh, sorry. That's all right. And you can just suck the room do, fluid out of there. Do you, do you lube up the PVC pipe at least? No, it's there's plenty of space just in raw. there. Yeah, oh. just <laughs> ram it on in there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the uh, the reason why we, we've been talking a lot about sleep, I'm balls deep in the sleep book. Um, and basically he was just kind of saying that like without uh, adequate sleep, it kind of puts our body into like, uh, like after you smoke weed and you get the munchies, mm. like you tend to be hungrier and you want to reach for like crappier foods. Yeah. So I'd imagine that would, you know, something if you could change your gut microbiome to kind of reverse that or, you know, maybe avoid that, that might be something that is possible. So there's definitely some studies on, um, so like delayed effects of uh, microbial fermentation. So mm-hmm. if you eat a dinner, with a lot of carbohydrates or, or a lot of uh, complex carbohydrates. So mm-hmm. a lot of leafy, you know, leafy greens and, you know, uh, uh, things like that, what we consider prebiotics, right? Mm-hmm. What happens is the fermentation of those takes a long time. Well, not a long time, but several hours. Mm-hmm. So what's going to happen is you're going to get the production of short chain fatty acids over time. Um, and then they're finally going to be absorbed. And then, but that's going to be like six, seven hours later, Right. So around the time you're getting up for breakfast. So yeah. there's, there's definitely a correlation between um, eating a, uh, a dinner full of complex carbohydrates and indigestible carbohydrates and how you feel that morning, the choices you're going to be making that morning. How hungry are you, mm-hmm. right? So if you're, you know, if you're ravenous hungry, like, yeah, you're probably going to make shitty decisions. Um, but if you have just that little bit of offset edge because you have that delayed you know, nutrient availability, mm-hmm then you might be able to make a better decision during yeah. breakfast at least. Kind of like what Joel Green was saying, <laughs> the, uh, the meal is affected by the meal you had previously, right. the one you're having and the one you're going to have. Yeah. That's crazy. Um, what are some some things we can do to better utilize like the proteins we're ingesting? You know, mm. since power lifters, we're trying to get jacked. Yeah. That's tough. You know, and yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Don't let them get to your colon. <laughs> yeah. yeah. There's a lot of... Uh, a lot of stuff when it comes to like um, digestive enzymes and stuff. Yeah, you hear yeah. people talk about these things, and most bodybuilders uh, they seem to like them. Mm-hmm. I, and I think I think sometimes the case is that it's people that are just wishing that supplements work, mm-hmm. right? Whether they're actually really doing anything or not, it's it's. I think it's really hard to tell. And I think that uh, most of the time when you go to look at like science of it, if there was really like true science behind it, and it was like. Um, Digestive enzymes helped you digest 20 grams more p- protein per day. I, th- I think that everyone would take them all the time and it right. would be this big part of, mm-hmm. of everybody's uh, nutrition plan, you know. But I don't think a lot of the things uh, really stack up and work all that well. Right. So um, I know we were trying to cut it off here, but what was your cal- caloric de- deficit when you were um, uh, prepping? Uh, you know, I don't, I don't actually really know. Um, I know how many calories I took in, but I didn't really know what my demand was, but, right. uh, I would say that I was probably at like around 2,600 calories and it probably started going down towards around 2000 calories. Cause that was one of the dynamics I was, I, I really, it wasn't insane. In. It wasn't an insane drop, you know? Cause if you have, I mean, the micro, these microorganisms are going to be liberating calories for you, right? Mm-hmm. You're going to be getting calories from them. So right. depending on your, your composition, um, what it's geared towards, you know, uh, you know, a, a hundred calorie deficit for you might mm-hmm. be only a 50 calorie deficit for someone else. They might right. be getting more calories for something. So I was, I mean, with the, um, pretty strict diets that people are on, I don't think it's going to matter because it's right. consistent, right? Same thing day in and day be out. Be consistent. You... Don't be fancy. That's what Jay Cutler kind of <laughs> shared with us mm-hmm. on here. He knows the thing. Um, <laughs> I do think that, uh, people playing around with the amount of protein they take in, uh, could possibly be effective, but I, I don't know. Sometimes when you see like, uh, somebody will share that there's like Dave Asprey has shared, uh, some information about, um, these like low protein diets that you specifically go on for a period of time. Maybe you only have 
a hundred grams a day or 50 grams a day, like something really, a really low mm-hmm. amount, just come, just trace proteins almost. Um, that when you go back to eating more protein, supposedly the theory is that, uh, your body tends to, uh, kind of uptake that a little bit better than mm-hmm. had you just plowed through and always had 300 grams. But I, you know, I don't know if they're doing this on active people that are really training hard. They're probably not. So, right. They call it a hypothesis at this point. <laughs> I can't, I don't think we can establish a theory on that yet. But I mean, I mean, I have seen some stuff about like pancreatin. Mm-hmm. So um, that's a, a, a pancreatic enzyme mixture um, from pigs um, that people can take to help break down um, uh, some proteins. And mm. um, actually when, uh, so my daughter has that dairy protein allergy. Uh, my wife is going to utilize those to help break down that stuff faster to get it out of her, uh, out of her uh, body. You know, so she can return to breastfeeding faster. Mm-hmm. So um, they, they, and there has been some studies for that. So clearing proteins out. So there's some validity there. Mm-hmm. Um, actually, I think that study was actually done at UC Davis here. Yeah. Um, so they, we know they work. I mean, they're enzymes. They yeah. break down proteins. Right. Um, but what benefit are you getting from that? Mm-hmm. And a lot of these guys like. I, these studies aren't <laughs> these studies aren't built for people you know like Brian Shaw yeah, yeah. <laughs> who are taking in this this amount of food mm-hmm. like it's like <laughs> the event horizon like well it looks like it goes this way right but once you get past like I don't know like seven pounds of food a day <laughs> like we don't really know what the fuck happens yeah, so. <laughs> I like some of the theories too that like um with some of the guys when when they're very simple you know again going back to that theory of uh, Jay Cutler saying you know don't be fancy just be consistent. Um, I remember Ronnie Coleman, somebody asked him like, when you take the 200 pound dumbbells, uh, and you press them like that, how come you don't lock them out? And he said, hurts my elbows. (laughs) 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 You know what I mean? Like, uh, simplicity is really a beautiful thing. And if you're eating and you're trying to gain size and trying to gain muscle and it appears that you're heading in the right direction and it looks like the scale is trending upward, then you maybe don't have much to worry about. Stomach feels okay. Right. Your your energy levels feel uh, on par. Sometimes your energy levels can be a little compromised when you start to eat more. Um, and then same thing with you're trying to eat less. Scale trending downward, feel okay. Um, getting lightheaded during your workouts or you dehydrate. You know, like you got to kind of track some of these things. And if some things start to feel way off, well, then you got to kind of reevaluate. Oh, maybe I need more water. Maybe I need more sleep or. And that's the hardest part is, I mean, you're, you're making, especially if you're making radical changes, like if you're trying to, you know, change your life around, like I'm going to do everything healthy and everything you change, well, everything healthy, you're just going to change everything about what you're doing Mm -hmm. is you don't know what's contributing to what. So making these small incremental changes over time, like that was good. Like that, that makes me feel good. I'm going to keep doing more than that. Uh, Like, I changed this. didn't really like it. I'm going to come back. Right. And the problem is, you know, you change too many things at one time. You really don't know. It's like, you know, squat form. You know, I see guys uh, go in there and they're like, oh, I'm going to, you know, get my feet wider, point my toes out, make mm-hmm. my knees out and like try to be upright at the same time. I'm like, fuck, like yeah, <laughs> you're one... just going to fucking learn how to squat again. Yeah. One, yeah <laughs> one, one thing at a time. You're right. So, um, you know, as a, as a scientist, it's like, how, the, what do we know what's working if, you know, we're changing all these things at the same time. Mm-hmm. So, um, small, just incremental progress. Yeah. For sure. When you were talking earlier about studying uh, iron and stuff, I, um, there's some theories that uh, uh, women uh, live longer than men uh, due to the fact they have their period and due to the fact that they are releasing blood. You know, men can go and, like, give blood. They can mm-hmm. donate blood, and that can help drive down your uh, your iron, I guess, or maybe right. your red blood cell count. Well, uh, the heme. So the iron in your red blood cells, right? Um, so the heme molecule is just a little iron mo- mm-hmm. iron. Um, inside uh that hemoglobin um so actually the the so the lineage of my the men in my family have hemochromatosis which is the body um is very good at extracting iron from food you know Mm. from red meat so that's where you know that's where most of the iron is going to be and so what happens is over time is it starts to build up in, in the organs um, so my dad, for instance, uh, gives blood like once a month right? and he has a freaking stack of like, they give him this like free ice cream pint, <laughs> <laughs> like a That's pint for great. a pint. And it, I thought it was hilarious. Like how, how drug dealer is that? You know, I'm like, what's up? You want <laughs> yeah. some ice cream? Give me, give me some of your blood. Yeah. That's hilarious. <laughs> but, uh, that's interesting. You know, I haven't, I haven't, I haven't seen any direct link, mm-hmm. um, with that, but it definitely goes 
to show the body. Iron is so important in the body because everything needs it. Microorganisms right. need iron. And so your body, as a part of its immune system, scavenges iron from its from the blood. Right? Any free iron, it's gone. Because mm -hmm. if it's like you can do this in the ocean too. If you put a drop of iron out in the ocean, boom, algal bloom. Because it's a limiting nutrient. If you add that nutrient back in, you're gonna have uh, you're gonna allow microorganisms to grow and can't have that. Mm. Right, especially not in us. Um, you know, algal blooms, whatever, out in the ocean. Um, so keeping that iron like nice and safe and bound up in hemoglobin is very important. Um, so the body's just too good. Right? Yeah. <laughs> We're just too good at it. So um, you end up with an overabundance of iron in some cases. Exactly. So you get heavy metal toxicity in um, some of your organs. Mm. Um, can cause you know liver failure and things like that. Um, so luckily, um, you know, my dad found out about it. Pretty early, right? He's um, able to control it. Well, he got some blood ran down. I was like, "Well, your fucking iron's out of control." <laughs> I have uh, my blood's B negative, mm. so I'm a mutant. You're special. <laughs> <laughs> they call me all the time. They're like, "We need your blood." <laughs> no, yeah, a pint of ice cream. I'm like, you can't tell that my blood's just full of trend. <laughs> <laughs> you guys aren't. That's not registering. Like over it's there? mostly trend. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Whoever's getting it's just like, <laughs> wow. <laughs> like I need another. I yeah. need another. That's like what rich people do. It's like you get blood transfusion from young healthy people. Yeah. This <laughs> like this is good shit. <laughs> Anything over there, Andrew? We're all good. Yeah, we're all good. Wonderful. All right, my man. Hey, it was awesome having you uh, yeah. here on the Poop Cast. Thanks yeah. for sharing all those, uh, all those, uh, all that information with us. Of course. Uh, tell us if you want to. Tell us where people can find you or reach you, or oh, if you uh, don't want to, you can leave that off. <laughs> um, so you can uh, find us on the internet, theheslab.com. Um, see our research, uh, what we've got going on there. Um, we're also on Twitter now at the Hess Lab. If you want to reach out to me, I guess you can. Um, strongmanbrook at gmail.com. Uh, you can find me on Instagram at Strongman Micro, um, but other than that, kind of leave me alone. I'm not very good at the social media, the, the Instagrams. <laughs> you can tell my terrible posts. Uh, so <laughs> follow my posts; they're really bad. Yeah, You'll hate them. <laughs> um, it's just me, fucking delirious at like 3 a.m., like <laughs> getting ready to do shit. So, uh, leave you ever me train alone. at any normal hours? Uh, so yeah, during the weekend and shit. Mm -hmm. Like if I want to get. You know, our, if our crew wants to get together, yeah. So we have original team Big Sack, right? But then we have Big Chico as uh -oh. well. Because when I when I moved Big to Chico, Chico like, fights with Big Sack. Like we started, <laughs> like uh, a nucleation site up there, a bunch of guys. Um, so we get together, try to like maybe once a month, um, try to get everyone in the same cool. spot. Um, and then I'll train at like ah, fucking eight, mm -hmm. eight a.m., nine a.m., something like that. Tyler's still around. Uh, yeah, well, he's in, uh, uh Vacaville or mm -hmm. something like that. Was, um, I know he's coaching some kids for a while and stuff like that, right? Um, he's pretty deep in his, uh, he was doing, uh, corrections. I think he mm -hmm. might be at the sheriff's, uh, department now. Oh, cool. Um, but yeah, he was, he just did a, finished a show, Northern Nevada Strongest Man. Um, awesome. Just, I'm going to, I'm going to probably see him on Friday. Yeah, have well, come on in, man. Come, yeah. I don't know, we don't, we don't have all the strong man toys, but we got some. We some got strong some, man toys. Everything's yeah. a strong man toy. If you're yeah. brave enough. Yeah. I mean. Just pick up the monolith and walk with that. <laughs> <laughs> so we, that's a hilarious story. Um, so James and I drove up because Tyler asked us to, and we took that fucking monolith and that Forza bench down to Jesse Burdick's gym in yep, Dublin. Yeah. And that piece of shit Ford F one fifty just like loading the both. We're like, we'll take the monolith. Like throw this bench in there too, and we're just like, oh shit. And we're like, blah, we had blah, like blah, 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 we, blah, blah. we had like one strap on it. Yeah. And the whole way down there, we're just like. Mm, it might not get there. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Might not. Might not hold steady. Yeah. yeah, you actually helped move the gym too, which was awesome. Yeah. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you the, so much the, for the Chico crew came up there too. We just that's Hell what yeah. powerlifters ask strongmen to help move. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> Somebody, somebody's got to move because we're stupid. And we're just like, oh, you want to fucking, you want to lift some weights? It's like, like, oh, you, you want to see? Stuff? Oh, you want to see how fast I can lift all these forty fives <laughs> into your gym and, and set it all up so fast and make it nice and neat and clean? Yeah. <laughs> I'll do it. Right. And you had pizza. So. Oh yeah, that's true. All right, strength is never weakness, weakness is never strength. Catch you guys later. <laughs>